Salutations. Welcome to Pod Mortem. I'm Travis Hunter, joined as always by my co-host, my sister, and my brother-in-law. Hi, I'm Renee Hunter Vasquez. Hi, I'm John Paul Vasquez. This week, we're broadcasting live from the Chenard Institute, discussing the 1988 supernatural horror film, Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. This film was directed by Tony Randall from a screenplay by Peter Atkins and a story credited to Clive Barker. Released a little over a year after its predecessor, Hellbound, Hellraiser 2 reunites much of the cast and crew in a direct continuation to the story of the Cotton family. This film provides an expansion of the lore and mythology surrounding the Cenobites, while also maintaining the grisly entanglement of pain and pleasure that the series is known for. With interesting concepts, impressive creature design, and elaborate gore effects, it's no wonder this film is often listed as a favorite sequel among horror fans. This film was recommended to us by friends of the show, Spooky Mom, Michelle Moore, and Lala Thomas. We'd like to thank all of you for your continued support of the show, as well as this suggestion. So, Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. What were your first impressions on the film? I don't remember the first time I seen the movie, but I remember that I had seen it. Uh, I want to say once or twice, because there is stuff that I do remember, like I remembered beat for beat happening in the movie. Oh, really? Yeah, but uh, there was a lot of stuff I was like, oh shit, I don't remember this happening. So it, I don't want to say it was kind of uh, a fresh watch, but I mean, that's about half and half. Okay. Um, but I, I did enjoy this. I did like this movie. I, I think there was, I was a confused a little bit sometimes. Okay. Other than that, I mean, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. I, I still think I like the first one a little more, but uh, this one wasn't bad. This was a fresh watch for me. I don't think I've ever seen this before. If I have, then I don't remember yeah, it at yeah. all um i'm surprised at how much i liked most of this yeah. yeah uh very surprised because you know i'm not very familiar with the franchise i know a lot of people are i know a lot of people love it but all you hear is how it kind of jumps the shark and yeah. you know whatever i wasn't necessarily expecting it to go downhill on the second one yeah. <laughs> speaking of which does anybody else feel like the title's backwards yeah, I've never. I don't, yeah, I, I don't like it. Yeah, I, I didn't understand that either. Hellraiser two, Hellbound. Hell yeah, yeah. Um, it feels wrong every time I say it. You know, I I have a theory because the story is called the Hellbound Heart. Yeah, they wanted to call the original Hellbound, and the producers made him call it Hellraiser. So I think Clive Barker's like, "Fuck you." <laughs> He's like, "We're putting Hellbound." No, they're we're, still putting. Yeah. It. Well, they're, no, yeah, yeah, they're putting they're, it first. Yeah. Well, maybe not fuck you because we're also putting Hellraiser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> half and half. Either way, it throws me off every time. It doesn't sound right. But I think I was a little surprised by how much I liked the first one. And I was really surprised by how much I liked this one. Yeah. The end isn't as great for me. Like the back piece. Yeah. Uh, it feels back, back piece. piece. Yes. <laughs> so it's a it tattoo. Feels, <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. It feels a little rushed. I mean, we'll get to it when we get to it. But for me, there are a little bit of issues there. But the things that they were able to do with the effects, incredibly impressive. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think. And I almost went back and listened to the first episode that we did on mm -hmm. Hellraiser. I, I, I can't do it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I can't bring myself to do it. But I remember us wanting more Julia or being very excited about Julia. Yeah. So yeah. getting her more in this, more, no pun intended, flushed out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> A treat. Yeah. We get oh, a little no, yeah. backstory here. I would say not enough, but we get a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think mean, we get some. For you know? <laughs> Tad. Yeah, yeah. Tad. <laughs> um, and I don't know if we get more going further. This is the furthest I've gone into the franchise, but I really liked it. Right. I was kind of in the same boat with it being a first time watch. I figured if I did ever watch it before, I I didn't pay attention at all. Yeah. You blocked it out. I just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I do agree, for me, the best asset of the franchise, for me, having only seen two films of it, yeah. is Julia Cotton. Yes. Claire Higgins in that role yeah. is just fantastic. She's great. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about where they wanted to go with the franchise after this film and where they unfortunately didn't go at all. Yeah. Mm. But um, I think that I appreciate it because there's a lot... <laughs> the first film... It's a lot of them being like, no, this is just what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this means just, this. Yeah. So accept it. Yeah, I was going to say, you just need to accept that. Yeah, you're either on board or 
<laughs> go go home. <laughs> so it was nice. A little explanation. You yeah. Made. Yes. A little bit of like background on some of these characters. Because, dude, I don't know. A Cenobite is a pretty big concept. Yeah. <laughs> to just be like just thrown at you. <laughs> so it's kind of cool to have a little bit of understanding more. Right, right. To see like, oh, shit, that could be any you know yeah, yeah, yeah. anything can happen you know it's yeah. interesting it's very interesting <laughs> but um i i did like it way more than i expected to for that exact same reason that you said all i know when i think of the hellraiser sequels is that they got to a point where it seemed like they were just making them for the rights right like we got to maintain the rights so let's make a hellraiser in your backyard this weekend yeah. right you know yeah. and so i don't know when that begins but I do know that for me, Hellraiser 2, or Hellbound Hellraiser no, but yeah, 2, yeah. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> is for me, I think, up there with the first. No, yeah. I, I agree. That that is that is something too that uh, and you it, you make a good point. I I was surprised how much I did enjoy. I was like, you know what, that wasn't bad. Yeah. I was like, that was pretty good. And I mean, it gets to the point, especially when you hear that it, this came out like a little over a year after the yeah. first one. <laughs> like, so they had to fucking. Yeah. yeah. And then how likely is that going to be something that's great? Yeah. And it's like, well, this is still pretty fucking good. It right. Is. So I was I was very impressed. Um, I did want to make mention of the fact that Clive Barker did not write or direct this one like he did the original. OK. Apparently, I watched that Leviathan documentary on Screenbox, not mm -hmm. a sponsor. Not yet. Not maybe yet. Who knows? Maybe one day. Yeah. Yeah. Call us. Yeah. We'll fucking say whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I love Screenbox. But the thing is, <laughs> is that I guess he was working on, he had some publishing commitments and he was working on a novel called Cabal. And Cabal would be what he would later adapt into the film Nightbreed. Oh, all right. So he was doing his own thing, but he did He's show busy. up. Yeah, he will vary. But he did show up on set for this quite a few times. There was a lot of behind the scenes stuff. I saw him there uh, mingling with Tony Randall and like getting some stuff together as far as maintaining the continuity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the design to make sure that it like this is a Hellraiser film. Yeah. So he was there. He just wasn't as present. Right. I did also hear that before Tony Randall was attached, he was actually an uncredited editor of Hellraiser, the first. Oh, oh wow. Sure. So he's been around too. So he kind of knows the way the world works and everything. But before it fell into Tony Randall's lap, it was actually attached to the writer Michael McDowell to write and direct it. But um, he, I guess, had to exit the project for personal reasons. Mm -hmm. The cool thing, though, is that he wrote... Um, I think he wrote Beetlejuice and the, <laughs> uh, I want to say the adaptation for A Nightmare Before Christmas. All right. Holy shit. <laughs> nice. So his film would have been fucking interesting. Yeah. I was going to say, those are treasures yeah. in this house, both of them. But I still think, you know, Tony Randall, he did a pretty fantastic yeah. Oh, yeah. job. First feature, this is the first film he ever directed. Oh shit, all right. And uh, they said that he was very, very nervous, but... I think that it helped that so much of the previous crew returned. Oh, yeah. So it kind of gives you that family feeling of like, we're making another Hellraiser. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everyone's here. And I'm glad because this feels like a perfect double feature. Yeah. It really oh, does. Yeah. It's, uh, this is a very bold Oh, hell yeah. Project for your first, like that, I yeah. can't imagine. <laughs> I'd have been like, you sure? And then nobody yeah. else. <laughs> <laughs> Now, before we make this film suffering legendary, we would like to issue a warning for spoilers. Pod Mortem is a very in-depth podcast, and in thoroughly discussing horror films, we have no choice but to spoil a thing or two. If you don't wish to be spoiled, please go watch the film, then come back and enjoy the show. If you've already seen the film or don't care about spoilers, let's open the box. Now, this film relies heavily on having already seen Hellraiser. If you haven't, we recommend you go watch it or listen to episode 51 of our show as a refresher. So the film opens with the sound of the uncredited merchant from the first film asking, What's your pleasure, sir? We're then treated to a montage meant to catch us up on the preceding events. We see Uncle Frank in the attic wearing the skin of Larry, played by Andrew Robinson, with chains tearing the flesh of his new face as he licks his lips. He mutters, Jesus wept with a chuckle before being ripped apart. And I remember <laughs> from <laughs> the first film, whenever we talked about it, where the line wasn't it originally, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> and we were like, this, just is, like, this yeah. is much better. It's 10 times better. I was just surprised that we were Jesus wepting right out the gate. Oh yeah. Like I was like, did I accidentally, because he watched it before me and mm -hmm. I was like, did I accidentally just jump into the middle? I was like, no, this is the beginning. It was yeah, like, yeah. okay, yeah. They're really Halloween-toing it. Yeah. yeah. Which I like. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. Totally fine with that. 
But Kirsty, played by Ashley Lawrence, rushes out of the attic. She bumps into the female Cenobite, played by Grace Kirby, who scrapes the walls bloody with a sharp instrument. She then retrieves the puzzle box from the dead hands of Julia, her stepmother, played by Claire Higgins. The lead Cenobite, played by Doug Bradley, and now officially called Pinhead in this film, sneaks up behind her as the box twists in her hands. He promises, we have such sights to show you. And we get quick cuts of Butterball, played by Simon Bamford, the weird engineer monster as yeah. well, <laughs> running down the hall with <laughs> hands for legs or whatever. <laughs> whatever he's got going on. Yeah, and also less scary, but Kirsty's boyfriend, Steve, played, yeah. by <laughs> <laughs> played by Robert Hines. In really not so great looking special effects, Kirsty dispatches the Cenobites with the use of the box, telling them to go to hell as yellow lights that were clearly drawn on in post-production <laughs> <laughs> encircles all of them. It was that in the blue lightning bolts. Yes, yes. <laughs> like, man, y'all really did that. And they're like, if you liked those then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned. But the music rises and we get the title, Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. This whole opening, I was like, this, this movie really said... Last time on Hellraiser. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my damn. It's like if you guys missed last week's episode. Yes. <laughs> uh, I did want to say the music again is composed by Christopher Young. All right. I feel like it's more almost operatic this time around. Yeah. yeah. It's like more like, like a choir. Mm -hmm. I like it. I think it yeah. did a really good job. It really fits, too. Uh, yeah, it's kind of because this film's bigger, too. Yeah. So it's like a sign of things to come. Yeah. But we then open on a shot of old radar equipment as machinery beeps and a man speaks in Hindi over the radio. We pan across elements of a military officer's uniform placed on a nearby bed before finding that officer in a long shot down a corridor. The camera presses in to reveal Captain Elliot Spencer, played by Doug Bradley. He sits crisscross, fiddling around with the lament configuration. I've said it before, mm -hmm. but I have to shout out Anthony Jerome M because every time I see someone fucking with one of those, I can't not think of him. Well, because they are so easy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they. One might say too easy. I think that's one thing because uh, I know in the future we will talk about the reboot slash remake. Right, right. They really put more emphasis on solving yeah. Yeah. in that one. And I thought that was very interesting because... Captain Spencer fucking presses yeah. <laughs> the very obvious middle button. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, damn, that was easy. Yeah. He's like, is, do I just press this? Yeah. Or, all right. It's like, it might as well have that on logo on yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this causes blue lightning to flash out of it. As he throws it out of his hands, shadows creep up around him, extinguishing all the light in the room. It's a pretty neat shot. Yes. Yeah. You see, they just like cover those. Because there's like these sliced out windows. Yeah. yeah. And they're, I don't know where the fuck he is. I don't know. <laughs> I put in my notes that it may be a hangar. I don't oh. know. I, I really don't know. Or is he on a submarine? I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Sure. There are no wrong answers here. There really aren't. Yeah. But he watches as the box blooms an opening. He then creeps towards it. But just as he gets close to it, hooks spring out, sinking into his flesh as he screams. Now, he is wearing, like, the officer's shirt, mm -hmm. but we do see a couple of the hooks sink into his skin. Yeah. Which I think are reused shots from when Frank... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm pretty sure Frank was shirtless in the first film. Yeah, he was. <laughs> like, those looked fucking great. Yeah. That's true. Well, use it. <laughs> <laughs> and they already use enough from the first film. Right. Here. Yeah. So they're like, why not? But the camera flies into his mouth, and we see clouds as well as a long stone walkway. His teeth grow filthy as his skin turns white and a grid is carved into his head. A fiery hammer pounds nails into the grid and he screams, his mouth filled with blood. He raises his head to reveal that he has become Pinhead. Y'all were like, ready. Yeah. Like, they were waiting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All the equipment was just, they had the hammer. Like, yeah. it was... Y'all were ready. smiled a little after. <laughs> he was <laughs> pleased. Right. Kinks are crazy, right? It's just like he was into it. He's like, you know what? I kind of like this. We got to stop the weekly caveat on okay. Kinks. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and have, or the pit stop. We well, have to stop. He, you know, he looked like he enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to stop. <laughs> He's just not going to stop. 
<laughs> I did. It did make me laugh though because these designs are so specific. Yeah. And so it they treat every person who fucks with this box like a build a bear, but like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> build a scare. Because yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, they're like, no, we're gonna fuck his head up with a grid. Yeah. We're gonna nail it in. Yeah. Gonna- <laughs> Again, they were but it ready. Looks good. It does. They have plans, and they have more plans coming <laughs> yeah. later. Because holy shit. But I did uh, want to say, because this is the first time and really the only time that they really go into more detail about this, mm-hmm. but adding that background, it makes you appreciative of these characters more later. Oh, yeah. You do. And maybe I'm just greedy, but I want more, though. Like, oh, yeah. We don't know. Like, where do you get that? Bo- <laughs> like, yeah. We don't really know <laughs> anything except the fact of like his job before right and barely and barely because yeah. <laughs> we don't even know if he's in a submarine yeah. I don't know if he's underwater right now yeah. dude. it's huge it's a big fucking deal they had said on that Leviathan documentary that they had more plans like this was going to be a much longer sequence right it was going to show him finding the box I would have okay. really liked that uh, maybe even have been the same merchant who knows that would have been yeah. cool that would have been neat but the budget wouldn't allow it right and so we got what we have But I did want to mention because Doug Bradley, this is why I love actors so much because thinking and hearing about their process, Mm -hmm. because he said that he loved getting this backstory in this film for Pinhead because the first film, he said, I was already kind of tailoring parts of the performance as a way that it was stemming from a morning of humanity that he couldn't remember. And I was like, you knew God, that already? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you pick up on I that? No idea. You're, you're a sex demon. Got, Got it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Say so, no more. Yeah. I'm mourning my humanity. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like, that's brilliant. Hell yeah. To bring that much to yeah. them. Yeah. And for what, the eight minutes he's on screen in the first one? Yeah. yeah. So fucking Doug Bradley. <laughs> but a voice says, ah, the suffering, the sweet suffering. As the camera pulls back in a swirl from Kirsty's eye as she lies in a hospital bed. It's funny because the way that it's taken from that, it could be like, well, was that Kirsty's dream? Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we just take it to mean it really happened. Yeah. But seated across from her is Detective Ronson, played by Angus McGinnis. He welcomes her back to consciousness and tells her that she's at the Chenard Institute, a psychiatric hospital. She looks confused and he asks her if she remembers what happened before with her and her boyfriend. He says that they sent him home, but he sure had a story to tell. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that made me laugh out loud because mm-hmm. they're telling the same story. Yeah. But they're like, Steve, just go home. Yeah. <laughs> like, why did he get to leave? Well, you're obviously well, innocent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless he rolled over on her. He's True. Like, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. She, uh, uh, she did it. That's, like, yeah. Fair point. Like, Can I go home now? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, of course. He's like, I started dating her last week, dude. Yeah. I, don't, <laughs> I don't even really know her, her like family's that. fucking nuts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did laugh, though, because it's the last time from the first film, the last time we see Kirsty and Steve. Right. They are throwing the box into <laughs> the fiery remnants of the home. Yeah. And a bearded man turns into a some kind of bone dragon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Takes the box and flies away with it. Right. Them. So that's what Ronson's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that's the story yeah. he had to tell. <laughs> but Kirsty politely asks who the fuck he is, and he introduces himself as a homicide detective. He says that he was at her father's house, and then she sinks into bed, kind of remembering everything that happened. At the house, though, we see Officer Cortez, played by James Tillett, investigating. In the dark, he finds Frank's sex photos, and he gives kind of a grimace. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're into some freaky yeah. shit. Dude. <laughs> but he then hears a sound coming from underneath a large basket. He inches over, lifting the lid to reveal what I assume is Larry Cotton's skinned corpse full of wriggling maggots. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, don't know how he didn't smell no. that before. <laughs> He's like, holy oh, shit. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's news to me. I say I assume it's Larry because they had to get his, I mean, he wasn't, he didn't have any skin. Right. And so, you know, where, where did they put the no, body? That, that yeah. makes sense. Because they never say, Yeah. we found Larry's corpse, sir. No. <laughs> sir. <laughs> That's never, well, he's on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> but just then, a decayed hand reaches out to him. And when he turns around, we see a skeletal corpse fall to the floor. I don't know whose corpse that is. I do. No. I can't piece that or together. Or why did the hand touch him? It, it reached no, out. Yeah, it did. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it, it literally did. It's like someone was puppeting it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in a knee-jerk reaction, Cortez fires at the corpse, destroying its face. 
He's already yeah. dead. <laughs> <laughs> like, way to go with the evidence. Yeah, dude. I know. You see, training went well. He touched him. He... So, uh, really? <laughs> he touched him on the shoulder. <laughs> That's conditional as a well, result. Well, he's a skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so you have a skeleton touch, you see what yeah, happens. Yeah. <laughs> But back at the hospital, Ronson asks Kirsty to tell him what happened, but without the demon fairy tales. Kirsty says that her father didn't believe in fairy tales either, but some of them come true, even the bad ones. Sometimes the fairy tales believe in you. <laughs> uh, hey, that's cool, <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> we, all, <laughs> we all want someone to believe yeah. in us. Right. Right. All right. Be it a fairy even tale. Even if it's a scary yeah. fairy tale. Yeah, be it the devil, whatever. <laughs> but Ronson is completely lost. Kirsty then asks him if he has a family, but before he can answer, they're interrupted by Ronson's radio. It's Officer Kusich, played by Bradley Lavelle, calling in, telling him that they found another body and that it suffered some accidental damage. <laughs> That's an understatement. Yeah. yeah. Cortez was looking at him like, you weren't there. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was really scary. It was a yeah, skeleton. Right? He touched me. <laughs> But Kusich says that the only other evidence they have is a mattress covered in blood with chains hanging from it. Ronson tells them to tag it and remove it, but when Kirsty overhears this, she remembers Julia's body resting on it the last time she saw her. The camera presses in on the mattress, which will become very important soon. He tells them to tag it as evidence. Yeah. Uh-huh. But dude goes, can we just send this downtown? <laughs> <laughs> like, he's like, I don't even want to deal with this. Well, I wouldn't either. That something bad happened, man. Yeah, no shit. And by downtown, does he mean the dump? I don't know. They're gonna arrest the mattress. I guess so. <laughs> it's like it's already got chains on it, yeah. sir. I don't. I'll just attach a handcuff. <laughs> but a light switches on in an operating room where Doctor Philip Chenard, played by Kenneth Cranham, waxes poetic about the human mind to the other personnel in attendance. His voice was made for a horror film. Yes. Yeah. Like the whole time, if I'm a nurse or something, I'm like, sir, like, can you stop? <laughs> like, he, that was fucking scary. I was like, I cannot do my job effectively. Yes. <laughs> you're scaring the shit like, out of me. You're throwing the vibe off in this whole room. <laughs> but he says that the mind is a labyrinth, a puzzle. While the paths are apparent, its destination is unknown and its secrets remain. As a patient sits there with her head opened and her brain getting some fresh air, Chenard says that the labyrinth is what lured them to this field to unlock those secrets. What are you talking about? I don't know. <laughs> the mind. I guess. <laughs> and I'm assuming this is like their first day of class or something. Yeah. Because <laughs> I would imagine a speech like this you've said before. It's a lot, though. It's, it's a lot. First to, day of class? Well, maybe too much. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the first day is like, why do you want to be yeah, a doctor? Right. <laughs> But Gennard says that others who have come before left them signs, but they must devote their lives to going further to find a final solution. Didn't like that. No. Not, not, not even a little bit. Immediately, I was like, oh, well, he's, he's the villain. Yes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. They made it. When you hear his voice. <laughs> it's very clear. They said, okay, so get this. They said Gennard is a neologism of, I guess, kind of a portmanteau of Dr. Christian Barnard, who was responsible for the first human-to-human heart transplant. Oh, wow. So you got Christian, Bernard, Chenard. Right. All right. Peter Atkins, the screenwriter, originally wanted to call him Malahide. He says it plays into Jekyll and Hyde. Okay. Right. Pretty cool. But broken down, Malahide literally means bad skin, which I thought was cool. Mm-hmm. But I can see how it could be a little on the nose if yeah. we're just meeting this dude and we're like, "Oh, this is Doctor Malahide." Yeah, <laughs> like, it's Doctor Baskin. Yeah. I thought for a second you were going to say Doctor Christian Troy. Oh, no, no. <laughs> where was <laughs> yeah. in eighty eight? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but the other personnel look on, including Kyle McRae, played by William Hope. They said a couple years ago he was in Aliens. All right. And I guess he was coming over to look for more work. I think he was doing some theater, uh-huh. but he had never seen Hellraiser, the original. Oh, wow. And he was like, oh, this would be pretty cool to be in. Yeah. And he just auditioned. He's he like, got sounds it. wholesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hellraiser 2. Right. Yeah. Hellbound. Yeah. Hellbound. Yeah. I'm sorry. God Hellraiser damn it. Two. That's just going to happen a lot. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but the patient is injected with a syringe and Chenard goes to work with an electric saw. Smoke rises as he tells them, we have to see, we have to know. He is then paged over the loudspeaker and he asks his workers to tidy up for him. He literally says, my part in this is over. 
I was but, like, what did you do? <laughs> yeah, you going to leave them like that? I, what wide the open. Happened? You literally, you sawed their brain for two seconds. Yeah. And you're like, well, my work's done. <laughs> did it, did it look? Did I, it no. Just... no idea. They'll figure it out, I guess. <laughs> I guess. But Kyle follows him out as he describes the circumstances of Kirsty Cotton, a young girl witnessed to multiple homicides, including her own family. She was brought here hours ago, and he wonders what tales she'll bring them from the other side. He says they have to examine her, win her trust, draw from her story, and take away her pain. It's like a weird thing to say, yeah. right? <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> well, I think... It's like a weird way to yeah. say it, at least. I find it odd. Like, I, I, you don't really think about... I mean, whenever I think of this doctor... Right. The way that he's talking about Kirsty is it sounds like he's a therapist. Yeah. But he was just opening up a brain. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know what he... What is your what? expertise? Like, I just don't understand. The brain? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just an every just all I guess. I'm a brain doctor, mostly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in her room, Kirsty is losing her mind, throwing shit around, screaming, and she has to be subdued by Ronson, who comforts her. She's not doing herself any favors. No. Right. But he's well, he was openly talking on the walkie-talkie about the crime scene at her father's house. And also I don't true. know that he like should have been doing that in front no. of her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there, they never really checked for anything outside of bodies. No, yeah. no, <laughs> no fingerprints. And I'm sorry, but didn't okay. So that doesn't make any sense to me because I could have sworn that the burn piles that we saw were supposed to represent the house in the first film. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're right. And they're like, "Oh, we're here, sir." <laughs> <laughs> yes, the structure is sound. It's like what? I don't understand. Not a bone dragon nope. inside, or whatever you said. <laughs> like, yeah. We have not. We have not seen sight of a bone dragon. No. <laughs> <laughs> but Ronson tells her that whatever she saw, they're gone. She disagrees, saying that she saw him, and then she solved the box, and they came. And then they obviously are the Cenobites. I don't think we see the engineer in this film. No. Yeah. Which is kind of weird. It was kind of a big uh, thing to introduce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then never. Yeah. <laughs> but when asked who, she tells him the Cenobites. He's like, well, that sounds delicious, but yeah. I, I don't know what you're like, talking about. And does about. it come with a dipping sauce? Yeah. <laughs> Those things they serve in the cafeteria? Oh, oh hell yeah. yeah. And you're scared? Yeah, they're not going to hurt you. Yeah, they're delicious. But just then, Chenard and Kyle enter the room. Chenard introduces himself and Kyle, saying that he read Steve's statement and asks if he can talk to Kirsty alone. Ronson concedes that it's now more Chenard's territory and tells Kirsty that he'll be leaving her in Chenard's care. But before he leaves, Kirsty tells him that he has to destroy the mattress that his officers found. She says that since Julia died on it, she can come back just like Frank did. And Frank is. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> That's true. Like, we don't know, the like, fuck I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> it's funny to me because after she says that, she's giving him direct instructions yeah. that are very important. And he just goes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, like, we don't. Did you kill Frank too? Oh, uh, okay. Is that? It, it's like you're just adding yeah, your fucking like, charges. You <laughs> <laughs> but he leaves, and Kirsty repeats herself to Chenard, who just stares at her curiously. He then steps out, leaving Kyle to watch her. Chenard sidles up to Ronson in the hall, telling him that he'll be able to help Kirsty, but only with Ronson's assistance. Back in the room, though, Kyle introduces himself to Kirsty. He goes, I'm Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking laughed out loud. <laughs> he goes, I'm Kyle McRae. Call me Kyle. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's typically how it works. I, that was hilarious to me. <laughs> but Kirsty isn't picking up what he's putting down, just somberly telling him that Ronson didn't believe her. Kyle agrees, but he says that that doesn't mean that she isn't telling the truth. Chenard returns, but only to tell Kirsty that he has to visit one of his other patients and that they'll speak again tomorrow. He says Kyle will give her something to sleep, and Kyle goes to get it. But that night, with a storm raging outside, Kirsty tosses and turns in bed, which is intercut with shots of Tiffany, played by Imogen Borman, putting together a box of stone blocks in a nearby room. Kirsty somehow just steps out of her room yes. and into the hall, looking in at Imogen through a window in her door. It's like, you're just allowed to... I, it's fine, I what guess. What are the rules here? Yeah, yeah, but it gets more out of pocket. It's true. Keep going. Kyle sneaks up on her, 
accidentally scaring her and instead of admonishing her for being out of her room, he just remarks at how sad it is that Tiffany's here. He said, let me tell well, you the tea real quick <laughs> on Tiff. It's like, this is wildly yeah, inappropriate. Yeah. Is he a doctor? Because <laughs> no. I believe confidentiality is... He just told me to call, well, him, call him Kyle. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what he all is. Right. <laughs> but he says that she's been here six months with no family and no visitors. He calls her a mystery and says that she's completely alone. He says she never speaks. All she does is sit there and solve puzzles. But he says that a nurse named her Tiffany. Cool. Uh, <laughs> puzzles, eh? Indeed. Yeah. That's interesting. interesting. But now, Kyle, I think you're going to be running around telling everybody my business. Oh, true. Because yeah. she didn't even ask. No. I don't trust you anymore. At all. Yeah. And what? they say she doesn't speak. Have you tried a pen and a pad to ask her anything? Anything. Yeah, I know. You're like, like where's your family? Who, you know, whatever. I mean, we learn. <laughs> yeah. It becomes very apparent. And I don't think you can just name people like that. <laughs> you're a nurse and you're like, mm, Tiffany. She looks like <laughs> Tiffany. That's <laughs> crazy. You can't just do that. There are laws and shit and paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> and do they have any reason to take her to a psychiatric hospital? That's what I was thinking. Would would she even be here? No. Like I don't. <laughs> yeah, I, it's a really I don't understand. I figure she'd still be down at the police station. Kirsty, right? Well, oh, well wait. You they yeah. said they said Kirsty was brought here a few hours ago. Right. So did they pick her up and they're like, oh, we're taking her to Chenard. Yeah, so right, right away. Yes. That doesn't make sense either. This don't, floor should be don't empty. Look too, yeah. don't, don't look too close. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't look too close at it. <laughs> Let's keep going. All right. As far as the puzzles are concerned, Kyle says Chenard thinks it's a good thing. Maybe she's putting something in order. Kirsty says, or opening doors. But Kyle's like, what? Yeah. But with a smile, Kirsty says it doesn't matter. I'm like, you, okay, it's tonight. It yeah. like super matters. <laughs> yeah, it does. It matters a yeah. whole lot. <laughs> and she just saw like four Cenobites a few hours ago. Her family's dead. <laughs> yeah. But she's like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Oh, Kyle. But he yeah. told her to call him Kyle. She did. So, <laughs> so we got to get playful yeah. with Is it. she in love already? <laughs> like, already. Are we Where's really? Steve? Oh, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> he went home, remember? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he was set free. <laughs> But Kyle takes her back to her room and tries to give her some pills, but she closes the door and says that they won't help. Kyle, after she closes the door, is like, they were just sleeping pills. It's like, you could have said that with Dora. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. <laughs> but back in bed, Kirsty lies down and closes her eyes. Just as she's about to drift off to sleep, steam begins to rise from the radiator in her room. A heartbeat thumps in her head as blood drips from the walls, and Tiffany puts a wooden box together in her room. A skinless finger draws letters through the blood as Kirsty rises in bed, fear filling her face. In the corner of the room, a skinned corpse lies in a pool of blood, pointing to a message written on the wall. I am in hell. Help me. Right to the point. Yeah. Yeah, help him. He reaches out to Kirsty, who closes her eyes tightly. When she opens them, the corpse is gone, but the message remains. So you could have at least cleaned up after yourself, because now it's going to look like I did that. Well, but the, where did she get the blood? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if she forgets? Yeah. yeah. You know like, I, mean? I can't stay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I could stay, I wouldn't be writing this fucking message. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that, uh, to me, that visual is just indelible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's fucking cool. And it kind of, this is the thing, because you see it so much, like, popping up on random things online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that this was from the first film before we watched it for the show. Oh, all right. And when it didn't show up, I was like, but what? Where yeah. was it? The <laughs> coolest fucking thing I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> it's not here. And so for it to show up here, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. And it's even cooler to me because there are quite a few sites in this oh, yeah. film. And you're like, you know, the amount of shit that these sequels get. I don't know when it gets bad. Yeah. yeah. But, but I can not vouch. Yet. No, yeah, this not is yet. still good. Yeah. yeah. Also, that's exactly how I feel during summer in Texas. Like <laughs> that. <laughs> that's what it is. I think we've actually written. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Kirsty sits up in bed, the camera swirling around her as she approaches the message on the wall and touches it to find that the blood is real. For some reason, she rubs the blood to her lips and we see Tiffany seated on the floor in her room, looking down at the completed wooden puzzle box. Um, okay, so rule number one, no more puzzles. 
uh, <laughs> I was hoping that you would have a reason why she was putting the blood on her mouth. Uh, the only thing I could come up with is kink. Yep, that's no. God oh, damn it! Well. Maybe we just need an allotted kink corner every episode. Maybe. Where you can just get it out of your system. Well, I didn't I, understand. I don't. Either. I don't sign I up on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out. I, <laughs> the only thing that's I could, your answer to yeah. everything. <laughs> the only thing I could think is that she's like, yeah, this is definitely my dad's blood. <laughs> yeah, <I'm about> <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. That tastes just, <laughs> like, yeah, my just like my dad's blood. <laughs> but <laughs> I think the thing is for me is that whenever we see in the next scene because she's like my dad you know yeah yeah but he had no skin no. yeah <laughs> and you've already met one skinless corpse we it could be anybody yeah, no shit we all look like yeah. that on the end that could have been me <laughs> like <laughs> you have no fucking idea right so i mean i don't know long story short i don't know but the next morning Jannard walks the grounds of the Institute, past patients, and through a path of hedge animals. He heads inside, vaguely checking in on a room of patients. One of the patients in a wheelchair, played by Edwin Craig, laments that after 105 years, Chenard still doesn't know his name. I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> what an asshole. <laughs> He's had, it's like Mr. Burns status, dude. Yeah. <laughs> but Chenard reaches the maintenance floor in the elevator. <laughs> I'm laughing already. I'm sorry. Look. Fucking the word maintenance. <laughs> I can't spell the word you, maintenance. You stumbled a couple times. I did. This is, the, this is the third time I've said it, and I can't say it. That's just what it's going to be. Just leave it in. He reaches the maintenance floor. There you go. Okay. And instead of supplies and cleaners and shit, the door instead opens to a dingy floor filled with orderlies manhandling screaming patients. The conditions down here are abysmal. Like, yeah. yeah. Like there there's machinery like being loud as fuck. There's water drip like it is horrible. Yeah. It's like a nine inch nails video down here. <laughs> <laughs> is this the beginning of an American horror story? Well <laughs> the theme song. <laughs> I was thinking whoever, we can't say who wrote that message, but he's like, help me. <laughs> <laughs> but Chenard <laughs> peeks in on a bearded patient fighting against invisible entities, as well as another patient painted up with crosses all over him, warding off evil with a crucifix. That dude goes up to the window and he's like, do you read Sutter King? <laughs> <laughs> That's, exactly, I even say that. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought of. He looks just like Sam Neill. Yeah. I was like, was that Sam Neill? <laughs> but Jannard then slides the slot on a door open to see the screaming, wide-eyed face of a patient and then just shuts the slot without comment. <laughs> He's like, everything's like, in order? <laughs> 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 what an asshole it's just so weird because you see him up top and he's like we need to get their trust we yeah. Need yeah and he's like <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking, it's fucking evil. Yeah. evil but mr browning a patient in a straight jacket played by oliver smith screams for chenard to get them off of him but we see that nothing is there chenard kind of smirks at that and it, it's worrisome enough because he's already shown that he doesn't give a shit about any, yeah. of these, any of these patients. But it's even worse because it's like, well, what, he, what is he planning? Yeah. And we soon find out. But upstairs, Kyle checks in on Kirsty, who is seated in her chair in her room facing where she saw the corpse the night before. She tells Kyle that she had a visitor the night before. And it was definitely her father. <laughs> She's like, trust me, my dad wrote notes like that all the yeah. time. Yeah. And they all <laughs> tasted the same. <laughs> it can be no one else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Zero chance. <laughs> <laughs> but Kirsty says that her father is alone and suffering. Kyle tries to remind her. He's like, your father's dead. But she repeats herself. He's dead, alone, and suffering. Instead of responding, he just says that he's going to go get Chenard because he's sure he can help. Kirsty sarcastically asks him if Chenard has any tickets to hell. He's like, I'll ask him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. You got it, boss. I'll, anything you want. But Kyle goes to get Chenard, but overhears him on the phone talking to someone about Ronson and Julia's mattress. He says that he'll meet this person by the side entrance. And then he hilariously says, <laughs> no, no. My house. Let me make that clear. The house. 
not the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make this well. perfectly clear in case someone is eavesdropping. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> needs to be in a discreet packet. Yes. <laughs> I, it just made me laugh because he is that is cartoonishly evil <laughs> it really is and we already knew that he was going to be bad yeah. but he's like I want to leave no room for miscommunication <laughs> I want that mattress at my home <laughs> but after hesitating a moment Kyle finally walks into Chenard's office I did appreciate the way he walked in was as, as if he had the energy of coming down the entire hall yeah. Yeah. that was very smart and yeah. very good but they soon join Kirsty in her room, and she says that all of this must have been going on for forever. She says the part that destroyed her family must have started with her uncle Frank. We then see flashbacks to the first film, where Frank, played by Sean Chapman, meets Julia and seduces her. Even at Larry and Julia's wedding, Frank is there throwing looks. <laughs> I said, sir, <laughs> at the wedding? <laughs> He has no chill, dude. <laughs> <So. laughs> Good Lord. But Kirsty says that she doesn't know when, but they must have been with each other. We then see Frank and Julia banging up something sweaty. <laughs> yeah, banging I up did. something sweaty. <laughs> I, was, I was literally going to say making it sweet, but then I accidentally wrote making it sweat. And then, <laughs> and then I was like, I just need to describe no, it. No, no, they were making it sweat. I was right the first um, time. <laughs> it's funny because what did you say? They must have been with each other. Yeah. I feel like that was a very tame way. As well, we're fucking does. watching them, like well, she she's doesn't done. know. Yeah. Yeah, she's she like, does. no, they were fucking. Yeah. She's like, no, I don't know how hard they did it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you that they were doing positions. She's like, just trust Jesus me. Jesus Christ! But Kirst- <laughs> they were making a sweat. They were making a sweat. <laughs> <laughs> but Kirsty says that there's more. There was the puzzle box. We see Frank solving it, surrounded by candles, and then chains ripping into his flesh. Which we also saw with uh, the captain. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but Kirsty says that hell was what he wanted, and it's what he got. The Cenobites roam through a room of chains, Frank torn to ribbons, and his face lying in pieces on the floor. I, I don't know why, but even in the first film, it, it made me laugh that they fucked him up so much that his face is in pieces <laughs> yeah. on the I floor. Like, pulled him apart. <laughs> I liked them putting the pieces next yeah, to yeah. Like, like, No, it's still him. Yeah. No, it's, it's still Frank. Him. <laughs> when did you come in? See you come in, Frank. <laughs> but Kirsty says that she doesn't know how, but Frank came back to life. We see Larry's hand dripping blood onto the floor of the attic, which sparks the chain of events that led to that awesome special effects sequence in the first film of Frank's body piecing itself back together. Looks so great. Oh, yes. Yeah. Why was Larry bleeding so much? <laughs> <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you recall, okay, there was a montage in the first film. Yeah. Julia's in the attic, like reliving her making it sweat yeah. with, yeah. <laughs> with Frank. <laughs> and then they're moving the mattress up. Yeah. And he but I feel cuts like, his hand. Oh, I yeah. Feel like, that's I right. I feel like it was not enough. Like that blood was splashing onto the floor. It was a what? tough nail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same for Julia and Frank. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the thing that did make me laugh, though, is that when you because there's that moment in the first film where Frank has come back to life. He's that skeletal right, right. muscle situation. Yeah. But he's just coming back to life and he kind of roars into the night. Uh-huh. Kind of not at all caring about who hears or <laughs> <laughs> anything like that. In the first film, you hear kind of two noises coming from him. There's one that's kind of high pitched that almost sounds like a baby crying. Mm-hmm. And then there's him like, Wah! yeah, they forgot the roar here. And so, so just, I was yes, like, yeah. yes, when they show that clip in this yeah. film, it's just like, yeah. 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 I was like, what the fuck? I don't remember that at all. Yeah. <laughs> it threw me off. That threw me off too. Cause I was like, surely I, I would have yeah. remembered that. I was like, I guess he's being born again. Sure, I, yes. I was like, I'm not. I tried to put oh, it in Yeah. <laughs> That's I like, all I could come up with. They clearly, I was like, they fucked yeah. up. <laughs> but Kirsty says that it was Julia who brought him men to make him stronger so she could have him again. And we see her luring and killing men for Frank to feed on. 
the way that she's just detailing it. She's like, yeah. no, Julia was a fiend for that D. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to do whatever Frank said to do. I mean, it's just <laughs> well, <laughs> nobody's going to believe. You know that they're not yeah, going to believe what no. you're saying. She's like, maybe if I add more surreal details (laughs) (laughs) they'll they'll start to buy into this (laughs) but through further flashbacks Kirsty says that she made a deal with the Cenobites for Frank's life after solving the puzzle box and went home to rescue her father but found him murdered with Frank wearing his skin I will say even this was one of my knocks for the first film is that when you see Frank wearing Larry's skin he's clearly wearing Larry's skin yeah and (laughs) Kirsty takes forever <laughs> to be like, why is your fucking yeah. forehead bloody? She didn't try to taste it. She did no. nothing. So it's just weird. If you're really my dad, write a note. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll let know. me eat it. <laughs> <laughs> but continuing to read from the spark notes of the first film. Thank you. Yeah. I was like, did they not expect us to watch the first one? I do not know. But Kirsty says that Frank betrayed Julia, left her to the Cenobites, and then they came and took Frank. We then see his gruesome death once again, and she asks if they believe her. So, <laughs> no. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was nothing about your story no. that was believable. The thing is, though, is that Chenard kind of has a look on his face, which we understand later. Right. Yeah. But he says that there is a lot of work ahead of them, which is what a doctor would yes! say yeah. <laughs> after hearing that. I did want to say, for me personally, that was pretty flashback heavy. <laughs> yeah. <well. laughs> it's exactly what you said. It was the yeah. spark yeah. notes of the first film. So I, and I, I don't understand. I don't know if it's Plus a matter. Plus more babies. Out. Yeah. Because <laughs> that wasn't involved. Yeah. <laughs> and the, they decided to add that. But I think that the thing for me is that it is that they don't, I don't know that they expected people to see it. Right. Or they just wanted to make sure that even if you don't see it, it still works. I can can understand if they just named it Hellbound, but you still have Hellraiser 2 in the, like, it is obviously a sequel. I feel like we've had like three flashbacks already (laughs) explaining what happened. But if it's Hellbound... It just sounds funny saying Hellbound Hellraiser 2. It does. It oh, looks yeah. like it's a Hellbound 2 Hellraiser. What the fuck is that? Yeah. <laughs> I've well, never yeah, seen it. We did, yeah, yeah. We did, we I never saw the first, first one. Yeah. Like, you know what? We'll just kind of also do the first one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me think, Was it? Is it Silent Night, Deadly Night 2, where it's like 45 minutes of flashbacks to the first film in it? Really? I, don't, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I heard it's like basically like 30 minutes of new footage. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta i can only hope that they include some of the songs <laughs> that's all i ask that's the only thing that'll make us forget yeah. you're forgiven but later that night chenard skulks around his study julia's mattress having been delivered to his house and sitting on the floor not not the hospital no no, no. yeah <laughs> his house he literally said i want to make this clear yeah <laughs> that's amazing he's like do not bring that shit here But he downs a drink and shuts off the lights, leaving his house. We then see Kyle breaking into Chenard's home, finding the mattress on the floor and only having one word for it. Weird. Can we talk about the way he broke into the home? Yeah. Sure. Just shoving a screwdriver into the keyhole. That's uh, apparently. I was like, is it that easy? He found that like under a false rock. Yeah. (laughs) I think my thing that bothers me is that he heard the entire story. No, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. He heard Kirsty telling Ronson that he had to destroy the mattress. Yes. Yeah. He sees the bloody mattress on the floor, and he's like, weird. <laughs> That's part of it. I think it's a little more than weird. Love yes. it. Love and it. What are you going to do on that mattress? I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's been done on that mattress. Wow. Well, <laughs> We don't need to talk about that. Uh, We've already spoken. (laughs) But Kyle walks past grotesque medical photographs, diagrams, and a whole ass skeleton remarking, fucking weird. So Doc is into some freaky shit. Yeah. And that skeleton was clearly used to be a human. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That wasn't a science class situation. Yeah. He's just (laughs) fucked up already. Clearly. He's like, I don't allow anyone in my home. Yeah. (laughs) But Kyle then stumbles upon three puzzle boxes encased in glass. He just goes, Jesus Christ. Once again, what was Kirsty's story about? The, the puzzle yeah. boxes. 
the uh, in the way that he has broken in here, like there could be someone else here. He doesn't know at all. Right. He's making running commentary out loud. To yeah. <laughs> Janard's like, I'm just moving tea in the other room. <laughs> it's a really poor decision. I think the thing for me is that again, he doesn't see how it all connects or whatever. Right. But it takes what we see next for him to be like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But let's get into that in a second. <laughs> Back at the Institute, Chenard rides down to the maintenance level, approaching the door to one of the patients. But back in Chenard's study, Kyle finds a notebook of articles, one discussing the link between the psychic phenomena and puberty. Another article questions if death is the fourth dimension, but Kyle keeps flipping through it and finds an old photograph of Captain Elliot Spencer in his uniform, as well as drawings of the Lament configuration. He looks at the drawings and at the boxes back and forth, and then he asks, what's this? <laughs> okay, Jack Skellington. <laughs> God damn. But Kyle hears Mr. Browning screaming to get them off of him on the other side of the door, so Kyle stashes the book away and hides behind a curtain. This, I don't know how long Kyle has been here, but Chenard has been- He's left! Yeah! <laughs> gone down to the maintenance, <laughs> grabbed Mr. Browning, come back, like, yep. what are you doing? How much time do you need? And he's yeah. barely piecing it together. Yeah. <laughs> What's this? Dude, did you should have just, you should have sent Christy. Christy. Yeah, no Something. Shot. Like, come on, man. You are not the man for this job. <laughs> not at all. But from behind the curtain, he watches as Chenard leads Browning into the room, relieving him of his straitjacket. Browning begs, scratching at old and opened wounds as Chenard sits him down on Julia's mattress. This poor, poor man. Yeah. It's so sad. Like this just, this whole part took it to an entirely fucking new level. Yes. And we thought he was evil before. Yes. Yeah. But Mr. Browning sobs. And for a moment, we see what he sees, his skin covered in worms and maggots. Chenard finds a straight razor in his desk and offers it to Browning, and he takes it and then immediately begins slashing at his own chest, blood pouring from him as he screams. What a fucking piece of shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I was getting heated watching this. Like, him exploiting this poor man. It yeah. was just, and then the the whole thing with the straight razor, it, that was just hard to watch. No, it is. It because the makeup lot. on his scars and sores yeah. looks so good. It does. It was like, oh, like it was hard to watch. They had said in that documentary that there were people that were on set for this. Yeah. And they were watching it and they kind of had to turn away. I don't blame them. No, yeah. Because like, it's like, holy and he's shit, just, dude. Yeah. It, yeah, that was, it was yeah. pretty rough. It's bad enough on film. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Imagine being there. Yeah. Because yeah. the one thing that I, that did kind of stick out to me was in the sound design you hear. Yes. Yeah. It's like, okay, 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 we got it. We got it. Because this goes on for fucking forever. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it does. But he continues to slice away at himself, but he falls back, finally slicing across his own neck and for some reason his crotch as well. While this is happening, Chenard is looking at him like... Like, he looks, like, judgmental. I don't <laughs> well, know. I was like... You made all this happen. Yes! He closes the door, and it's like, dude, that door's been open this whole ass time. You, what the fuck? <laughs> and like, it doesn't now? matter. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Like, nobody's gonna... It doesn't... Come on. <laughs> it's just getting more and more ridiculous. But as Browning's blood soaks into the mattress, skinless arms and legs punch through with a roar and wrap around Browning as smoke rises. Got birthed right out that yeah. mattressy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> mattressy. <laughs> That's awful. That is awful. I I'm gonna <laughs> just go past it. Yeah, just go get past, past it. it. I want to say that skinless Julia is played by Deborah Joel. We notice through at least the first couple Hellraiser movies. I can't speak for the later ones. A lot of people don't play their skinless counterparts. Yeah. yeah. And they said that the reason for that is that they needed rail thin actors because playing these skinless versions, it's literally muscle and bone. Yeah. yeah. And so you can't have anything that's like distracting from that frame. Yeah. 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 And so they also said they said they tried to accentuate the femininity of skinless Julia. Yeah. And one person said that they hoped that people watching were still turned on. Oh my God. And I'm like, she has no skin. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know what you're. I mean, I she, mean, there were still titties, but yeah, there were, but, but not the kind. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, it's still hot though, yeah. right? They're like, we just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> they turn in their designs. They're like, you're still. The <laughs> 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 you're you're feeling this, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, they said that, and I was like, no. But I get what they're saying because everything about this is the pain and the pleasure. Right, right. So they're like, even if she doesn't have skin, we still want you to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just it made me think of uh on the Simpsons when the fog turned them inside out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And nobody was That was not hot at all. Not at all. How dare they? One sniff of that fog. But <laughs> They tumble off the bed together, Browning and skinless Julia, Browning attempting to crawl away, but Julia catches up with him as he slips on his own slick blood. This poor fucking man. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I can't get over it. And it just gets worse and worse. Browning reaches out for the curtains, but Julia crawls on top of him, sinking her hand through the back of his neck, chewing wildly as orange goo leaks out of his mouth. So he might be a silver shamrock android. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not All sure. All signs point yeah. to yes. I would hope so because I don't want to have a person having gone through this. Yeah. yeah. But this whole time, Kyle is eyeing the side door that he came in from like, <laughs> should I? <Yeah. laughs> I the fact that he, he could help. Yeah. He, oh, yeah. He said, no. oh, nope. <laughs> Honestly, could he though? He's yeah, what is he going to do? This, I don't know. like skinless demon thing and also Chenard was bigger than him. <laughs> <laughs> so really, my name's Paul and the shit's between y'all yeah. was, was the move. It's the smartest. I'll just stay behind the curtain. <laughs> the door's right there though. Like they can see him. Yeah, like, yeah the door right, was not yeah, hidden behind the curtain. Well, but the glass of it, they just see him solid <laughs> snake <laughs> against the wall. I, mean, I think that's fucking Kyle standing there. <laughs> no, he's one of my students. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and i will say i do want to point that out as well because that kind of is a dropped ball yeah that i want to talk about as we get into it later all right there's something that they really could have done that would have been interesting with kyle's character but they were like nah we're not gonna yeah. do that all right but julia rolls over satiated after chewing up on mr browning staring at chenard and asking him for help she pulls herself onto the mattress finding the strength to sit up and tells chenard not to be scared of her she looks fucking great yes. oh yeah she's not making it easy for him i will say yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> i'd be horrified but she stands and her skeletal muscles glisten in the light they're so wet when yeah. they're in like muscle form it is like disgusting it is in the best way yeah i wanted to call out jeffrey portis and the team of image animation because they're the ones that did the work for these makeup effects mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and like you were saying the you see the veins you see like yeah it's so intricate it's so well done they actually were the same people that worked on the original hellraiser oh nice so that continuity yeah they're like this is what a skinless person looks like yeah. in this world. <laughs> they said that after had they had done skinless frank so many times for the first one that skinless julia was like a breeze compared <laughs> wow oh, yeah. they're like we know how this works yeah we know what it's supposed to look like when it's done and i for me, you know, I, I say this a lot. Um, the ghoul of Mr. Grantham in Creep Show is like my favorite ghoul ever. Mm-hmm. I don't think there ever is going to be a cooler skinless thing. Oh, yeah. of course not. Than the Hellraiser. Yeah. The first two anyway. I can't yeah. vouch. Cannot vouch for the other eight or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the other 50 of them. Yeah. But Julia turns to Chenard and just says, well... I was like, well, what? Yeah. <laughs> what do you want? Are we dating now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are we? Yeah. But in her room of puzzles, Tiffany puts together nine blocks to form a crane. Very good. All right. Uh, all right. <laughs> I didn't know what that was supposed to symbolize, but I feel like every inner cut is just like she's really good yeah. at puzzles. Like they're really making sure we know. Yes. And we know, trust me. We get it. But the next morning, Chenard finds Julia in the living room, having left a trail of blood and a red handprint on his pristine white wall. It's like, can you Please stop touching on my white yeah. shirt. Please. Who told her she could wander around? I have no idea. We got to get her some gloves yeah, or something. Yeah, no, stay on the mattress. <laughs> well, <I'll> just, <laughs> this is yeah, your I'll area. I'll bring you food. What do you I'll, need? Yeah, don't move. <laughs> Frank had run of the whole attic, though. Yeah, yeah but, but, that, but that, that was, was wooden, dirty wooden already. Floors. That's yeah. true. Yeah. These yeah, are white true. carpets. Yeah. She's, it's really disrespectful. Yeah, she should have thought ahead. <laughs> but you back and everything. Yeah, and gonna, this is how you're going to act. Turn my house into a fucking pigsty or... 
But she stares at her reflection in a mirror before screaming and punching the glass, shattering it. So now you're breaking my shit. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> yeah, God. The disrespect, it never ceases. She tells Chenard that she's cold, and we cut to several heaters in Chenard's house. That's probably because you don't have any yeah. skin, buddy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> buddy. <I mean>. Wow. <laughs> he lights a cigarette for himself, and we see Julia rounding the corner wearing white pants and a white suit jacket. The white suit was the move? Yeah. Like, that's the one that you well, gave her? They gave Frank a white shirt in the first <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> it's logistically, it's the worst choice, Yeah, but it looks bad. But visually, it does, yeah. yeah. It looks so cool. I mean, it, real boss babe, oh, right? Yeah. Energy? Yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, sh- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Chenard approves of the outfit and says that she looks, but she finishes his sentence strange surreal nightmarish he attempts the sentence again but julia goes straight for a glass of white wine taking a sip of it clearly having missed it she's only been dead for a day i think right <laughs> <laughs> but she then takes chenard's cigarette from him and smokes it with a smile you can go on and keep that cigarette. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i got a whole pack it's fine don't worry about right. it i didn't want it anyway yeah no, that's no. okay right. it was actually for you i yeah. was starting it for you <laughs> yeah but he then wraps her skinless body in bandages. <laughs> I was going to say that she looks like a mummy, but yeah. she's Kirsty's step mummy. Nah, yeah. <laughs> very good. The wrapping sequence takes so long. It does. Yeah. It's like even the gauze is like, God, damn. <laughs> like, you want to cut some of this? Or? But she turns around also wearing a dress now, I guess. Yes. So I don't know how much time. Yeah. I don't know where he got the dress. Either. He, so. I, he was planning ahead. <laughs> yeah. He's like, she's going to come back. But she slowly approaches Chenard, placing her hands on his shoulders, and they dance together for a moment before she presses him against the wall and puts his hand on her ass. All right. I, okay, we've already established the doctor is evil. Yeah. (laughs) And he's into some freaky shit. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Okay, now we're in the king corner again. I didn't. We are now leaving the king (laughs) (laughs) corner. Very brief stay. Yes, yes, yes. Just a stopover. I didn't. I didn't expect him to be so into this right. pre her getting her skin back because True. he's not upset about it. No. And even with Julia and Frank, I don't remember Julia making out with skinless Frank. I mean, he's like, it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> he did say yeah, that. He's like, yeah. fuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, she is all gauzed up. Maybe that yeah, helps a little bit. Oh, the guys are like, I told you she was sexy. Yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> But as they kiss, he raises her dress and we see her bandaged legs, but also her musculature. So he didn't wrap her completely, I guess. Yeah. Well, he... Never mind. Oh, yeah. come on. <laughs> Grow up. <laughs> <laughs> a maybe little decorum. A, maybe a joke about easy access. Uh, a little well, decorum, you please. fill in the blank. This woman has no skin. <laughs> <laughs> She's a fiend for that D. I've already, yeah. We've already established this. She stops him tracing her mouth with his fingers and telling him that now all they need is skin. She's like, now I understand why Frank was so insistent. Yeah. Was, was so in skin. <laughs> <laughs> it just burns, dude. Yeah. It's, skin. it's funny because it is total Frank status now. Yeah. She's like, man, you know, walk a mile in someone else's <laughs> skin. skinless body. <laughs> But they said that Randall wanted them to tongue kiss here. But Cranham said that it was like looking at a, something out of a medical book. And he said also that the actress had the flu. And he was like, God, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. He's like, yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> Something's telling me he made that one up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like sick or something. So we're not yeah. doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but back at the Chenard Institute, Kirsty steps out of the shower to find Kyle waiting for her in her room. I thought that it, I don't know. Okay, I thought it was a weird angle of her in the shower, and then on that Leviathan documentary, Imogen Borman said mm-hmm. that they had asked Ashley Lawrence to do a full nude here. For what? Why? <laughs> For what purpose? Yeah. I have no idea. But they, she, Ashley Lawrence said no because it's, it's not necessary. No. Yeah. And so I, I wonder if that's why the angle here is weird. They're like, well, we already lined up the shot. We don't know what the well, fuck maybe, we're doing. Well, maybe maybe they were like, you saw a woman with no skin. Now here, yeah, I mean, I don't know that, some duality <laughs> something. I what no. one with skin. Yeah. One yeah I don't. I don't know. The good lord. Like this is what she's missing. You know. Uh, did but <laughs> maybe if it was a transition from her 
skinless exactly. Christy in the shower but with it skin, was not but that's not what happened no well because that that can honestly if you're thinking of it that way in that transition she's like all we need is some skin she's nude in the shower and it's like oh shit they're gonna take her skin yeah that's what you would think right right, right, right. but uh yeah that's fine without yeah, it yeah it's not necessary at all no. but full of fear kyle tells her that it's all true she was right and he's gonna get her out of here I love that he says this and she has no follow up questions. No. Like, where did he just go and find out that she was telling the truth? Right. She's just like, yep. Well, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> dude, I'm sorry. If someone believes me, I don't give a fuck how they. Yeah, but wouldn't you be like, did she come back? Are y'all fucking with that mattress? Like, how do you know that I'm telling the truth now? Okay, because an hour yeah. ago, you did not believe me. Well, he goes into detail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it also doesn't doesn't seem like it was very hard for her to leave anyway. She was fucking wandering around That's earlier. True. She was just why, out. Yeah. Why, why didn't you just take off? You guys don't want to believe me? I'm going to go... I don't. There's yeah. no police here to stop her. Nobody. No. Yeah, her so door's she, not locked. She fucking t- is got she out. here voluntarily. I was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. All I do know is that she goes to her closet to get her clothes, but they're all gone. Yeah, and she's very upset. Yeah. Well, why are they gone? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Kyle says that he'll go get some clothes for her, and we return to find her dressed and looking in the mirror. Kyle then recounts the horrors that he witnessed at Chenard's place, and Kirsty tells him that Julia does not deserve to come back. She tells him that she needs the puzzle box, and Kyle tells her that Chenard has boxes at his house. She asks him if they're like the ones in her story, and he goes, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so nonchalant. Yeah. <laughs> Which, again, I'm sorry, it leads into a theory that I had, but does not go anywhere. Okay. But go ahead. But have you ever seen boxes like that before? (laughs) (laughs) Never. They're exactly what she described. Yes. Where where did you see that anywhere else? He's like, you know what? Yeah, Yeah, probably. Yeah, Yeah, you might. I think you might be onto something. (laughs) But she says that she's going to Chenard's house and he asks her if she's crazy. She says, am I? You're the fucking expert. I was like, I dig the sass. Yeah. Yeah, It's pretty good. But she says, and I also don't like Kyle very much, so it helps. (laughs) (laughs) But she says that she's going there to get her father. Kyle's like, give me two seconds. And he rushes off screen, I guess to get his jacket because it's not in the frame. Yeah. So I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what he did. But he comes back and he tells her that he's going with her. She says that he doesn't have to. But he then caresses her face and tells her that he knows. What about Steve? <laughs> what about Steve? Remember Steve? He fucking yeah. ratted on me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, I don't know her. Yeah. <laughs> she kidnapped me and made me destroy a box yeah, or something. No shit. <laughs> Can I go home? <laughs> For all we know, he did. That's yeah. why he got to go home. He's not in this film <laughs> yeah. at all. <laughs> Can I go home? That's why I was like, we never see Steve again. No. I mean, she saw him walking by the window. He had McDonald's again. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> but I did want to point out, so they've had like maybe two conversations. Right. Yes. And he's, I understand she's very pretty, but he's like in love with her. He's like, I'm yeah. going to put my life on the line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like literally. Like after, dude, I see what he saw that night. We're leaving Good town. luck. Oh, yeah. no, yeah. The, if you want to go, good luck. Yeah. Yeah, world, come with me or you can stay here and do that by yourself. These are your yeah. two options. Yeah, that's it. I met you last night. Yeah. He's like, that's my boss, dude. <laughs> <laughs> my job's in jeopardy. <laughs> but thunder crackles and lightning strikes outside of Chenard's house as he shares a kiss with Julia. I think these crazy kids are going to make it. Yeah. We can only hope. But she walks away from him and toward a nude woman hanging by chains at her wrists. The woman screams as Julia grabs her by the neck and tears through her flesh. Well, Julia is a very scary looking figure. Mm -hmm. Fair. And the woman was very chill until Julia was like right up on her. (laughs) Well, she didn't have her glasses on. (laughs) She's like, why is she wearing a red? Oh my God. God. (laughs) But the camera pans across the room and we see several other victims hanging by chains in various states of undress and decomposition. So it's not exactly clear or explicitly stated or anything uh-huh. but has he been doing this yeah or, i mean because a lot of them looked pretty decom like in various stages of like, right, decomposing right. so but he's just fucking doing this to people and then now he's like oh you know what 
We could probably use the skin <laughs> yeah. from one of those. Wait, you mean he's doing this on the side? That's what yeah. it looked like. There were so many people. Yeah, there God there damn. were. I'm like, so have you? What the fuck is going on? It's. I want to say it's never clear how much time passes between her wearing the white suit and her wearing that dress. Yeah. Yeah, but they just left the institute. It takes a week traveling. <laughs> 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 They're traveling on horseback. So Kyle was in the house for a very long time. Apparently, yeah. before he See, came back. Because at first I was like, "Well, is this all for her? Did he like rent a van or something and kidnap right, right. like yeah, twelve people I don't, I, in one night?" That's, yeah, yeah. That's what I was kind of confused about. But if he's doing this weird, like his death, the fourth dimension, mm. like pleasure, pain, shit that he's doing, maybe he's experimenting on these people. Maybe. All right. Because it does not. It. I don't think all this was for Julia. No. no. Well, and he's been having these three boxes. Yeah. Yeah. So who knows? Okay. Yeah. Maybe he is like a. I fucking... think he's been doing some fucked up shit for a really long time. And he's just using his talent. Yeah. And he's yeah. like, you know what? Skin. I have some of that. <laughs> like, come here. Well, this lady's new. Right. She. She. He's new. Right. Yeah. And I do want to also point out that I don't know what Julia's muscles and bones are made of. Well, I do know that they're made of bone <laughs> <laughs> and muscle mostly. But she is just able to dig into people's <laughs> neck. See, that's yes. that, that too. I was wondering what, as like, because you're really strong to be shoving your hand in the back of people's heads. Yeah, and like, her nails were done at this point, too. Oh, man. Well, how much skin has she had? I don't know. No. <laughs> what does it do for her? I don't know. It's like her nails it. were painted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like biotin. It like <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> but Gennard approaches the formerly skinless Julia with a pair of scissors, removing her bandages. And when we cut to her, we see that Julia has completely returned to herself, once again played by Claire Higgins. The bitch is back. It's great. But didn't Frank need skin from somebody else to put it on? Hers just like grew back. Yeah. Well, maybe Frank's punishment was worse. Because <laughs> didn't he, like you said earlier, didn't he have to have like the staple marks around his head? Yeah, yeah. you're and right. Had, yeah, but, but she looks her, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and her a full head of hair. Yeah, she looks oh, great. Yeah. No, she yeah. does. Like she looks she, fantastic. Yeah. She yeah. has hair and makeup done. Yes. Oh no, yeah. <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> and as I said, her nails are done too. Yeah. Maybe she ate someone with really great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And is she eating them? I'm not certain. I'm not. I'm yeah. not sure. I, you really just see her digging in with her hand. And then they cut away. Mm -hmm. Right. They're like, we've shown you <laughs> enough. We don't need people. You got to leave yeah. something to the imagination. Very little, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but she does smile at Chenard and it's almost a, uh, it's a live kind of moment. Yeah. Because yeah. the lightning flashes on her face. That had to be an homage. Oh, yeah. I do want to say Julia for me is just such a fascinating character. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. We see all the stuff that she goes through from the first film and then seeing what is ahead of her in this film, there's a lot of development. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's why it kind of bums me out. This is she. Claire Higgins is I, never in another Hellraiser film. I hate to know that. Yeah. I had read that people were just more interested in Pinhead. He's more of a, a visually. That's like the mascot. But you know like, what I mean? Right. Can't, can't we have both? I love she's such a good villain. Yeah. And I think that the way things balance is I don't think and I again I don't know how it goes later. Yeah. Yeah. But the Cinnabites, they're kind of they're more of the fuck around find out yeah. variety. They're not I wouldn't cast them as villains. You opened the box. You did yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, and he literally says, You opened the box. We came. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause and effect, motherfucker. <laughs> like, that was not no, me. Yeah. So I, I always thought it would be interesting. And again, don't know how the sequels go. But if you have a main villain like Julia, right. and the Cenobites are kind of on the fringes, they're like, um, like the backup singers sure like if, Julia that, and the if that helps you yeah because that's basically what it was in the first film right frank's the villain yeah, yeah. you're totally right you know and the cinnabites are like all right well we're here now yeah. <laughs> so, we gotta take you back we're yeah. taking your skin or whatever <laughs> so i don't know why don't they care um uh, well they've been through enough <laughs> i guess we're taking your skin or whatever well that's pretty tame compared to the other shit yeah. they do fair they enough they had to put his face back together dude <laughs> <laughs> But that next morning, Chenard leaves his home and we see Kirsty and Kyle sneaking toward his house. It does make me laugh because any time in this film that someone sneaks into his house, we have to have a shot of him leaving. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Going about his business. <laughs> it's like, they're fine, guys. Like, yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. But they do make it inside and into his study. 
in broad daylight do yeah, yeah. I, his neighbors don't care i guess <laughs> like that dude's an <laughs> asshole anyway <laughs> yeah you hear those noises coming yeah. from this <laughs> fucking house but kirsty goes right for the puzzle boxes but kyle says that they're not going to do anything until he checks the house he says to wait for him here while he goes to investigate elsewhere in the house he stops at a door where flies buzz over decomposing corpses on the other side he reaches out for the doorknob, but thinks better of it. Just then, he's startled by Julia, who tells him that she knew she had to stop him before he cried out. She says it's terrible in there. But instead of asking who she is or showing any fear at all, <laughs> Kyle simply asks, is it still here? The fact that presumably this woman has caught you breaking into this home. <laughs> yes. And she's not upset. She's not scared. Yeah. He's just like, oh, hey. Yeah. <laughs> the whole interaction is so fucking weird. Oh, it's you. Yeah. What, are you yeah. what are you so happy you about? You know it's the skinless lady. <laughs> yes. My, here's, what the fuck? <laughs> I think my thing, and this is where I was kind of upset with what they didn't do with Kyle's character, yeah. is the fact that we see this interaction. Okay. I think that it would have made a lot more sense if because we didn't see Kyle escape that night, mm -hmm. maybe they did catch him, and maybe like Kirsty made a deal with the Cenobites to give oh. them Frank instead of her. He brought he her. He made a deal to give them Kirsty yeah. instead of him. Ah, uh, that right. would be really cool. But no, he's just a fucking he's just idiot. A, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's just a that, that would be really cool. Yeah. I thought it would make a lot more sense because this reaction is someone who knows Julia. Yeah, yeah. this reaction is. <laughs> He what? broke in. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> That's what it should be. I yeah. also really love that she has put on earrings. Like this bitch oh, just yeah. really like pulled herself mm -hmm. together. I she ate someone with earrings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when Kyle asks if it's still here, Julia says that she doesn't know. He then opens the door, finding the ragged corpses of Chenard and Julia's victims. You know goddamn well you don't... There's nothing behind that door yeah. that you need to be a part of. No. And again, it would make sense yeah. if he was part of it. Yeah. But he's not. Back in the study, Kirsty flips through a binder, which kind of seems to be a manual on how to create a pinhead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it's... <laughs> it's like we start with one, <laughs> one part Captain Spencer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and add nails to taste. <laughs> <laughs> why is this here again i don't, I don't know, know. <laughs> <laughs> and i don't know how he knows that this is I, part yeah, of it at all <laughs> that i was confused what the fuck is this doing here i don't i don't know <laughs> and this is and again this is the same fucking notebook that kyle looked through yeah, yeah. so it's like well let's get kirstie's perspective on it. <laughs> let's see if she gets anything get else out of opinion it. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but julia steps inside the murder room closing the door behind her she asks if she was right, and he agrees that it is terrible in here. She then shows him sympathy, telling him he looks awful and says for him to come here. He goes right for her. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> she goes, come to mother, putting her arms around him and asking his name. We see, he's, he's like, like, you can just call me Kyle. Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> it's technically Kyle McRae, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> but we see that a piece of her spine is still skinless as he tells her his name. <laughs> yeah. And she introduces herself as Julia. She seals this with a kiss, sinking her fingers into the back of his head as he screams. The camera then dips down, and we see that her back is now completely covered. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah. So all she wanted was some head after all. Oh, right? come off it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I mean. That's a lot. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get through this. <laughs> you, you show up every day. <laughs> Fix that blown back out there. Oh, oh, God. <laughs> the camera dips down. <laughs> And the, it circles. You know what? I read the wrong thing because you guys have fucked me up. <laughs> That was really a one-two punch. Yeah, I guess so. I was not prepared. <laughs> sorry, sorry. The camera, you're fucking Muhammad Ali over here. <laughs> <laughs> but as it circles around, we find Kyle's face decomposing as he struggles weakly against Julia. I thought this was very cool. It is. But I was like, 
Kyle got got already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like what Jeez. the fuck? His body sinks to the floor with a thud, and Julia wipes his blood from her lips. So <laughs> that's what I was saying. I was like, Just you useless. wasted. Useless. Yeah. yeah. Instead of him being something more, like if he's a part of the conspiracy, you know, it, it's interesting. I that would have made right, it more yeah. interesting for sure. But he's just kind of a dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but hearing the thud of Kyle's dead body, Kirsty calls out for him. She's like, that sounded like a pig thing. <laughs> 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 Before she leaves the study, she takes that photo of Captain Spencer and folds it to put in her pocket. Yeah, I was like, go ahead and crease the vintage photo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's, mwah, genius. And she doesn't know anything why no. that's here. <laughs> <laughs> I need this. He's like, that has nothing to do. That's just my grandfather from the yeah. war. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking ruined it. <laughs> but she leaves that room and then she finds the room full of corpses, seeing that Kyle's husk of a body is on the floor as well. Lowly, she mutters, not again. Julia, still in the room, tells Kirsty that she has a surprisingly good taste in men. But she says that they've changed the rules of the fairy tale. She's no longer just the wicked stepmother. Now, she's also the evil queen. Yes, evil yeah. queen. I know we shouldn't be rooting for Julia, right. but no, I really but loved that. that. Was good. It's yeah, also, that was you're, you can't do a fairy tale callback because you were not there for that conversation. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, she hears all. <laughs> but I really, really liked we that. We don't know how hell works yeah. or whatever. <laughs> In a bit of camp, she says, so come on, take your best shot, Snow White. Love it. So good. Yeah. Kirsty charges her screaming, but is immediately slapped to the floor and knocked out. <laughs> Kirstie, immediately. <laughs> Kirsty runs into her slap. True. <laughs> she, That's yeah, what happened. Yeah. There was no defense no. here. I will. They said that this was meant to accomplish the sharing of the idea that Julia is now the queen of hell. Okay. And I feel <laughs> it is a little... <laughs> heavy handed because she's like now i'm the I'm evil the queen yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i mean it works i understand what's going on and they explain it even more later yeah in a way that kind of explains what that even means all right so that's kind of cool but chenard arrives on the scene calling out the julia and telling her that now it's his turn with him he's brought tiffany <laughs> he said i'm gonna get a pro on the case yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But we cut to Tiffany sitting on the floor of the study with the lament configuration in her hands. That thing is solved on accident yeah. most yeah. of the time. Like, we need a professional. Yeah. It's like, didn't Are someone breathe her put on those her boxes once, together? Or? Yeah. <laughs> she made a crane, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Gennard and Julia watch from the other side of the wall through a two way mirror. The two way mirror killed me. Yeah. yeah. This, is his, this was, is his house. Yeah. <laughs> he's prepared. Ooh, what is he doing oh, with that? I don't know. Oh. I don't he's, like it. He's just evil. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we know. But Tiffany turns the puzzle box in her hands, circling her thumb around one of the buttons. <laughs> I say button, but it's like. It's a fucking yeah, it's it's a button. button. <laughs> this causes the room to creak around her. She presses it in, and pieces slide open as the wind rustles around her. Julia asks Chenard if he's sure that this is what he wants, and he touches her face, telling her it's what he's always wanted. He has to see, and he has to know. Tiffany circles another button on the box, which dims the light in the room and causes lightning to flash. She's like, oh, this is the dimmer switch. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we need. <laughs> but when she finally presses that button in, a piece rises up and twists around, pressing itself into the box. The score and choir reach a crescendo. Chenard says that she's done it, Julia replying that she certainly has. Chenard then says that it's coming, and Julia replies that it certainly is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> that checks out. Hmm. But liquid rises in surrounding jars and blue light leaks from underneath the door. Suddenly, the door bursts open, shattering every piece of glass in the room and exploding books from the shelves. Walls then slide open, revealing bright lights and stone archways. I did want to point out that these stone archways look a lot like the ones that opened up in the first film. Mm -hmm. We didn't really... We're about to explore. 
Yeah. Yeah. We did not get that chance <laughs> in the first one because the second that Kirsty walked in, the engineer was like, what you got? What you got? What you got? <laughs> so <laughs> we didn't. We were under <laughs> <laughs> He's yeah, like, he's uh, get the fuck out of <laughs> here. What are you doing? <laughs> we didn't get very far. Yeah, <laughs> he no. was the bouncer. Is, I was going to say, is he security? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did want to point out that they do look like exactly the same. Yeah. Because the production designer from the first film is the same for this film. Oh, love it. All right. So I, that continuity. I love this the yes. way that they open the walls and they come and they like that's fucking great i don't know why it makes you think it looks you look at your own room yeah i know and it's like and fuck like, oh if my that God. wall <laughs> opened up like that <laughs> holy shit but from those pathways the cenobites enter we see butterball as we've explained earlier <laughs> yeah the female cenobite now played by barbie wild and the chatterer played by nicholas vince the chatter is fucking so yeah. scary. He's probably my favorite. Yeah. But also my least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to say because earlier I said Grace Kirby played the female Cenobite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She did in the first film. Yeah. But I couldn't get exactly why she didn't return on this film. Somebody had speculated that the makeup and costume were too uncomfortable. Ah. And so she didn't want to come back. Right. She's actually Clive Barker's cousin. Oh what? shit! Yeah, okay. which is pretty interesting. She's like, yeah. Clive, I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm not doing it. I'll again. see you at Thanksgiving, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she does not return, and Barbie Wilde has replaced her. I uh, watched a lot of interviews. I don't know anything about Barbie Wilde outside of those interviews, but she seemed cool as fuck. Her name oh, is cool sweet, as fuck. Yeah. It is. I think she was like a performance artist and like a singer. And oh, nice. Yeah, she oh, seems yeah. very cool. But the female Cenobite sharpens a blade as they all turn toward Tiffany. Through his own massive archway, though. Pinhead enters, telling the others to wait. The Hellraiser theme plays triumphantly as Pinhead tells them, no, it is not the hands that call us. It is desire. He said, nobody's horned up in here. Uh, uh, let's get the fuck out. <laughs> well, he knew. He yeah. Knew he did. That you didn't she do that innocent. shit. No. Yeah. You didn't know what you were doing. Uh, to me, I, I'm like, oh, that's that's cool. Yeah. But then there's something that shows up later that I'm like, oh, so you don't discriminate? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what the fuck is going on? <laughs> what are the rules? <laughs> but he peers over at the now shattered two-way mirror. He's like, that's fucking where it's coming from. Yeah. Yeah. But under twisted branches, Chenard and Julia walk through the green and blue lights of a stone pathway to hell. The Cenobites then leave Tiffany, and she watches as the box reconfigures itself. But then carnival music begins to play around her. Yeah, I was like, what? I, we understand later. Yeah. But right now, I... It's all right. I'm digging it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is this dog fashion disco? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that band. Anyway, they often sound like carnival music. <laughs> yes. You always make fun of me. It's carnival music. It was it's, good. It's great. I say that both of y'all listen to carnival music. <laughs> Well, just because we enjoy. (laughs) I don't see anything wrong with this. But in the murder room, Kirsty wakes up on the floor, the room creaking around her. Blue light beams through and Kirsty bails back to the study, scooping up the puzzle box and rushing through the stone archway. She walks through halls, calling out for her father. And overhead, we see the size of the labyrinth that she's entered. Yeah, I don't think he can hear you. Uh, No. (laughs) No matter where he is. Yeah. Tiffany follows shortly behind her and somehow stumbles upon a whole ass carnival. I did want to call out with that overhead shot that we saw. It looks like an Escher painting. Yeah, Yeah, it does. Like it looks confusing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of levels. Oh, yeah. I this is a very interesting idea of hell. Yeah. Yeah. Is all I'll say. But Tiffany enters a tent stumbling upon a hall of mirrors. Each reflection of her is replaced by a shot of Tiffany's mother played by Catherine Chevalier, pleading, help my daughter to someone unseen. I was kind of waiting for the beat to drop. (laughs) (laughs) The way they kept doing it over and over and over. I don't like the song. (laughs) (laughs) But an uncredited clown juggles his own eyeballs, his palms full of blood. That was creepy. Yeah. (laughs) I want to say I thought it was great. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And then we just star wipe right the fuck out yeah. of it. <laughs> You're like, You've, that's enough. <laughs> and it never comes up again. There's no. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> but it's a very cool cutaway. <laughs> but when we star wipe out of that, we see Tiffany in a dress and pigtails crying out for her mother. Then we're back in the Hall of Mirrors. Tiffany stepping closer to a mirror to see a fetus with its mouth sewn shut. The fetus is also holding the needle and thread, 
which only complicates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the baby does clean work. Oh, yeah. It looked great. It looked great. But clowns then laugh at Tiffany, shattering the glass in the Hall of Mirrors, and she leaves the carnival. It was rude. <laughs> <laughs> well, she didn't pay admission. Yeah. <laughs> She's it lucky she got anywhere, that. Yeah. yeah. She didn't waste anything. But walking through the massive labyrinth, she raises her hands to a cloudy sky. Elsewhere, Kirsty continues on, confused and lost as the wind whips around her. I'm sure there's one of those you are here maps somewhere. <laughs> like in the mall. Yeah, she's yeah. just got to find it. That could only be helpful. <laughs> it's like I'm in the blue area. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to get to the orange oh, area. Oh, shit. I am yeah. way off. <laughs> <laughs> Your dad is here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but suddenly, though, she finds herself back in her childhood home. She finds photos of herself and her biological mother and looks at them warmly. Just then... Blood begins pouring from them, and we hear the sound of a baby crying. Or it could be Frank. Frank? <laughs> <laughs> but when she looks back at the photos of her mother, her mother has been replaced by Julia. That was rude. Yeah. Y'all did not have to do that. Not at all. But the cabinet holding the photos bursts open with bugs, shattering the glass and crumbling to the floor. Kirsty screams as the room fills with fog and the camera swirls around her. She screams for help and then finds herself surrounded by the Cenobites in the dark. They're like, hey, girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they really are happy to see her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> they greet her warmly, relishing the fact that she's in their presence again. Kirsty frantically messes with the box, but Pinhead asks her facetiously, how could it send us back, child? We're already here. And so are you. Mm -hmm. I mean, the logic. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> the box then levitates out of her hand, shape shifting into what appears to be a stretched out diamond. I thought it was a plumb bob from The Sims. Uh, uh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Is that that green thing? In yeah. The okay. You, that has a name. Yes. Oh, uh, and you know it. <laughs> You are eight the fuck <laughs> up. <laughs> this is bullying. I'm not gonna, <laughs> You're not gonna take I'm it. I'm not gonna stand for it. But Kirsty pleads that she did not open the box, but the female Cenobite calls her out. She's like, You didn't open the box last time, you didn't even know what the box was, and yet we keep finding each yeah. other. It's like listen, all of that yeah. was true though. <laughs> <laughs> it was <laughs> Butterball licks his chops as Pinhead says that Kirsty is eager to play and reluctant to admit it. The female Cenobite calls her a tease, but Kirsty insists that she's just here for her father. Pinhead literally laughs at her and says that her father is in his own unreachable hell. Kirsty doesn't believe this and attempts to run away, but a chained hook sinks into the wall, preventing her from doing so. Pinhead reiterates, saying that her father is in his own personal hell, just as Kirsty is in hers. She unsuccessfully tries to turn it around on them, but the female Cenobite just says that they've always been here. Pinhead then takes the chain away, imploring Kirsty to explore. As she rushes away, Pinhead reminds her that they have eternity to know her flesh. Promises, promises. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you can't deliver. Yeah. You say that all the time. Yeah, I know. All talk. Keep <laughs> meeting here. Yeah. <laughs> now you want me to leave. Come on. <laughs> Playing hard to get? Yep. Playing hook to get? <laughs> <laughs> but elsewhere, in corridors lit in red and blue, Julia and Chenard continue on. I love the lighting of hell. Yeah. yeah. They had said something on the documentary about them being told that they wouldn't be able to have the lighting that they wanted. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, let's just try it. And then it worked just fine. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? But it looks brilliant. Hell yeah. But the sound of infants crying pervades the area. <laughs> Frank? <laughs> or it could be Frank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this unnerves Chenard. But Julia just smirks. Chenard peers in through a window and sees a strange slow motion three-way happening in very odd jerky moments. Yeah. She's like, oh, that's just the fucking pond. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's past the fucking the, pond. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just ignore that. You didn't see that sign earlier? <laughs> <laughs> but his eyebrows raise. The woman in the three-way turns her head away, and when she returns her gaze, she has turned into Julia. Chenard's face is like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> But before he can react fully, the real Julia urges him onward, 
telling him with a seductive smile that she has such sights to show him. Love that. Yes. Mm-hmm. She's taken on the lingo of the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But as he walks away, her face sours. I was like, she fucking hates this dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But Kirsty continues on as well, but once again appearing lost, rests against the stone wall. After a moment, a hand reaches out, startling her. It's Tiffany. We then abruptly cut back to Julia and Chenard walking for about one second, and then cut back to Kirsty and Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. They're trying to leave. They're exploring. All <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Let's uh, check back in with yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the people we left two seconds yeah. ago. Yeah, I didn't get that at all. But Kirsty pleads with Tiffany to close the box since she was the one who opened it. She says they're alone in all of this and that they have to help each other. Tiffany just stares at her wordlessly and they continue on. So I did see in that documentary that they reconfigured these hallways a lot like we talked about on 13 Ghosts. Yeah. They only had a limited number. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so they moved them around differently. I don't know if people got lost at lunch, like they said on the (laughs) ghost. (laughs) But it makes it all appear endless. Oh, yeah. It does. Especially the way that they peer down some of them. Yeah. It's like, I don't know whether, you know. You can see a couple of them where they have the same one, uh uh, where it's the painting of the hallways. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. You can see that one. But other than that, it looks like they're just running lost. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, I don't know. This, it's interesting to me because when you think of hell, you don't think of something this uniform. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, no, these are the chambers. And, yeah. <laughs> but, and obviously the fucking pond. But yeah. yeah, you don't, you think, I think of just miserable chaos. Yeah. And they're like, no, we have long, gorgeous stone hallways. Yeah. yeah. It's like, all right, I'll take well, it. Well, whatever you say. Yeah. yeah. But underneath cobwebbed branches, Julia and Chenard reach the top of the labyrinth. They observe a massive rotating prism, much like the shape that the lament configuration morphed into. Or a plum bob. Uh, Sure. (laughs) (laughs) So the Sims are Cenobites? Is it Cenobites? Cenobites. Uh, (laughs) Holy shit. It writes itself. That's amazing. Not really. (laughs) I think I oversold it. (laughs) I'm sorry. That's amazing. (laughs) I did hear in that doc, um, (laughs) whenever Atkins and Barker were kind of fleshing out, no pun intended, the story for this film, they had wanted more of a cosmic horror situation with this, what we'll learn is the Lord of Hell, Leviathan. Right. Um, They had wanted slimy tentacles, all that stuff. Oh, wow. But then when Randall came aboard Uh he decided that he thought of hell because everything else is so uniform Mm -hmm. as something more geometric all right and more fitting with the lament configuration in the first place yeah and so it is a very again another interesting take because this doesn't have any personality yeah it doesn't have any anything it's a fucking shape yeah Yeah. and it's still like holy shit it's a shape (laughs) you know (laughs) but chenard just says oh my god but julia corrects him This is her God, the one who brought her back, the God of flesh, hunger, and desire, Leviathan, Lord of the Labyrinth. All right. That's a good, I want to fucking intro me like that. (laughs) (laughs) But light beams into Chenard and memories flash before his eyes. He sees himself as a child dissecting an animal in a red room. He also sees the quick brain surgery that he kind of half-assed performed at the beginning of the film. And he sees Tiffany being prepared for an operation and his murder of Browning for Julia's benefit. I was, it made me laugh because I was like, well, you know, the animal, he did become a surgeon. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That could really go one way. (laughs) There's only two ways that this could go. I uh, thought of frailty when he's like, you didn't think anyone saw that, did you? (laughs) Well, God saw. I see it when he touches me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that would be so it's good. so good. But Gennard comes back to himself, peering off the edge, only to be zapped by a bolt of lightning. In his mind's eye, he sees Tiffany's mother begging him to help her daughter and watches as Tiffany solves the lament configuration. A glass jar explodes in a bloody display. Julia reminds him that this is what he wanted to see, what he wanted to know. And here it is. Leviathan. Yeah. Be careful what you wish yeah. for. I mean, shit. Th- w- wishes, man. I learned the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> That's Once again, Anthony. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's just some Discord lore, but. <laughs> <laughs> 
He gets one more blast of light and this time remembers making out with Julia in her skinless and skinful forms, wrapping her in bandages, and he just screams, help me. It made me laugh how quickly he realized this is not what he Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've made a huge mistake. Yeah, it's like, don't ask for shit then. Yeah. Like, but he's like, this is a bad idea. Yeah. You knew the way that this all came about. This was not going to be anything good. Oh, no. Do you walk through hell? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. You, like, if you being here and seeing the shit up until this point didn't make you think I shouldn't be here. <laughs> I fucked yeah. up. You haven't been paying attention. Yeah, no. <laughs> but just then, a pod rises from the ground and Julia asks why he thinks that she was allowed to come back. She finally confesses that Leviathan wanted souls, and so she brought him. So this is where the Queen of Hell comes about. Yeah. yeah. That she's made a deal with the devil to bring him all the souls that he wants. Yeah. Nice. Which, I mean, she already kind of did for Frank. Yeah. So she's like, I'm I'm the person yeah. for the job. Like I know And I get a title? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> bring you skin, bring you souls. It's really this All right. know, same well, thing. Well, yeah. maybe that's why she got to grow her skin back. Maybe. Maybe. All right. He's like, Better I'll give deal. you your hair too. Yeah. Because <laughs> Frank makeup. was just trying Earrings? to escape. Yes. And she's like, Oh no, I'll help. He was going against yeah. Yeah. All right. what Leviathan wanted. I do also think that this really sets her up to be the big bad yeah. Yeah. for the entire franchise. That's really disappointing. Very much. But she pushes Chenard into the pod where sharp, disjointed limbs sink into him as well as a syringe. Ready for another shot? <laughs> <laughs> Strips of sharp wire come down in front of his face as Julia reminds him, you wanted to know, now you know. Right, good for him. Good for him. Yeah. We set, we set yeah. goals, yeah. we reached them. He's finding out. He yeah, is. he fucked he around. He fucked around. Yeah. He found out. <laughs> She says that she wanted everything, and now everybody's happy. She says that. Well, yeah, well. <laughs> I don't know if that part's true. Well, he wanted to know. He knows. She wanted her skin. She's got yeah. it. Leviathan wanted a soul. He's got that. There you go. That's three out of three. <laughs> <laughs> but Chenard's blood is sucked out of him and replaced with a blue liquid as the wires wrap around his face and sink into his skin. A disgusting limb forces its way into his mouth as blood pours down his face. Julia simply says, goodbye, doctor, before leaving. She's literally amazing as a villain. Yeah. Yeah, she is. She plays it so well. But Kirsty and Tiffany continue on, stumbling upon the entrance to the house from the first film. Tiffany silently pleads with her not to go in, but she says that she has to. But she tells Tiffany that if she's not out of there really soon, then she needs to get out of the labyrinth on her own and go home. Tiffany somberly watches as Kirsty makes her way inside the house. Opening the door, she finds a path lit by candles. As she makes her way through, brightly lit beds slide out of corridors. Bodies are seen writhing underneath the sheets, possibly fornicating. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> well, I don't know. Fornicating. It's an apostrophe. Yeah. <laughs> but they slide back into the corridors as well. Another bed slides out, and Kirsty sees a body gyrating under it. When she removes the sheet, the body underneath it disappears. This is giving me Nightmare on Elm Street vibes. Yeah. yeah. Like oh, hardcore. Yeah. I love it though. Yeah. Yes. But she then finds a vanity with various makeup items and materials scattered across it. After being distracted for a moment by some lipstick, she looks just past that lipstick to find a photo of dear old Uncle Frank. <laughs> the <laughs> God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I've been had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she then looks into the mirror and written in lipstick, it reads... I am in hell. Help me. It's that sweet note my dad always yeah. reads. Me. <laughs> that sweet, tasty note that my dad. <laughs> but she asks, Daddy? The beds then roll out again. This time, the sheets covering the gyrating bodies are now covered in blood. Man, I think it's a boss fight. <laughs> <laughs> Hear that music kick yeah. in? And I love the visual of this is great. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, this might be, I thought the him writing on the wall. Yeah. I think this is my favorite thing. It's great. But just then, a switchblade is flicked open behind Kirsty. She turns around and through the shadows, out steps Uncle Frank. He asks her, what's the matter? It's only Uncle Frank. <laughs> <laughs> She's, he goes, didn't you get my message? It's like, that son of a bitch, yeah. how is he? 
Kirsty flashes back to the blood dripping from the wall in her hospital room and realizes that she's been tricked. Did we need to flash back, though? Because we, we just, just saw it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot. But he tells her that she's ripe in her confusion and luscious in her pain. It's your niece, dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. I think he's been hanging around Pinhead too long. It's <laughs> 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 a bad influence. <laughs> But she says that she wants her father, and he literally is like, grow up. (laughs) (laughs) And he tells her that when you're dead, you're fucking dead. I do want to say I'm a little mad at the Cenobites because they said her father was down here. Yeah. <laughs> she just wandered too far, but man. Maybe. Went, through, went in the wrong hallway, ended up here. Wrong turn. <laughs> yeah. I did want to point out because I saw in that documentary, Andrew Robinson, who played Larry. Yeah. He was supposed to be in this film. That would have made more sense. Yeah. They wrote a whole thing about the return like of him, but it was kind of weird because they had concept art drawn all right and in the concept art frank and larry were conjoined at the arm and so when she gets down to hell he's here but so is he oh all right but two weeks before they started production andrew robinson read the script and he's like yeah i don't want to do this and so you did all that crazy shit in the first (laughs) one (laughs) he didn't like the script I mean, right. I guess I got to respect that, but yeah. come on, man. It, it did. It's funny, though, because Peter Atkins, he was saying that when he had to rewrite it to get rid of Larry, yeah. he was like, you know what? Why would Larry be in hell? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and yeah. He did, he did nothing wrong <laughs> at all. I guess yeah, that's so true. No, yeah. it, it, it makes sense that he's- He got cheated yeah. on. He got killed. Yeah. <laughs> all skinned. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, it makes sense to not have him here. But it is weird that he doesn't show up at all. Yeah, yeah. it is. So, I mean, it does kind of suck that he said no to being in it, period. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it does make sense that he's not in hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But Frank swoops upon Kirsty, and he gets the upper hand very easily, telling her not to be naughty, otherwise he'll have to punish her. The bloody beds return from the corridors, and Frank tells Kirsty not to be jealous. He says this is his hell, and they're here to tease him. He says they promise forever and never deliver, which is why he sent for her. Ew. Uh, no, it's gross. Yeah, <laughs> it's again, real gross. It's, uh, what are you, a Lannister? Come on, man. <laughs> no, <laughs> a Targaryen. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah what well. the fuck? I don't know enough about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have not started House of the Dragon yet. You, you got him. Yeah, you okay. got it. I will. But just then, a clean bed slides out from the corridor. Kirsty then kisses Frank, slipping over to the bed, saying that if he doesn't hurt her, she'll do anything. Frank, the fucking freak, is totally on board. But as soon as Kirsty reaches the bed, she tells him that she'd rather burn and tosses the sheet into the candles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's action hero. Yeah. yeah. The the pocket sand. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> With a dry cool wet yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> Was the sheet covered in gasoline? That's the only yeah. thing. <laughs> yes. I pocket. assume. I assume so because that shit explodes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Frank screams, no. And he attempts to fight through the flames, but instead just stops and begins to tear his own skin off. He, but he's tearing his skin off and he goes, no, not my skin. <laughs> yeah. You're doing it. <laughs> Maybe he's trying to save it. He was ripping it off. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, not my skin. I just got and this. he did it with the clothes still on. He, he did too, yeah. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> The flames flash and he appears glistening fully skeletal muscle again. Still wearing that tank top. Like yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? And I do want to point out skinless Frank is played by Oliver Smith, who we just said played Mr. Browning. Yeah. Earlier. That's so cool. And he also played skinless Frank in the first film. Nice. And he played the skinless person that was writing on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so it should have kind of been a dead giveaway. Yeah. She literally... She saw skinless Frank. She did. Yeah. She's like, like, no, that's my dad. <laughs> wow, they really do look alike. Yeah. And it, it was, his blood tasted the same. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> shit. <laughs> but Kirsty and skinless Frank turn to the entrance to find Julia standing there, holding Tiffany by the arm. Julia sarcastically asks, family reunion? Frank is happy to see her, saying that he knew she'd come. She always keeps her promises. Julia tosses Tiffany over to Kirsty, who defensively stands in front of her. 
Frank says that he knows how much he means to Julia, which is a bit cocky. (laughs) (laughs) But he tells her to kiss him and they'll have a real family reunion. He says she belongs to him and she makes her way over. That family reunion line was gross. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So can we stop with the yeah, family stuff? Like, no. How about we don't talk yeah. about it? <laughs> but the music builds as Julia traces around his lips with her finger before pulling his entire fucking heart out. Kirsty lets out an, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Julia tells him, nothing personal, babe, and stares at the beating heart in her hands as Kirsty and Tiffany make their exit. Well, and he said that to her in the first one. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, I was like, honestly, good for her. Yeah. Yeah. Good for her. He it was so messed up because honestly, when he kills her in the first one, it was an accident. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, well, he's whatever. Like, yeah. I don't know. No great loss. loss. <laughs> <laughs> no great loss. He could have been like, no, 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 I'm so sorry. Yeah. But he's like, eh, you know, it's not that bad. Yeah, he didn't give a shit. <laughs> um, it did make me laugh that Kirsty and Tiffany are just standing there watching like they could have run away <laughs> the whole time. They're like, well, no, sh- I want to see yeah. Right. Yeah. where this goes. <laughs> They're reunited. <laughs> But as they rush down the hall, Kirsty trips and drops the Leviathan-shaped puzzle box, but they just continue on without it. Yeah, you're just going to forget that. We don't need it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's never been important before. (laughs) (laughs) But they reach three separate paths, and Kirsty asks Tiffany which is the way out. Before she can decide, a fourth path bursts open with a gust of wind and powerful suction. Tiffany tries to hold onto the wall as to not get sucked in, but down the previous hall, we see Julia retrieve the puzzle box. They're being like sucked into like a vortex or something. Yeah. Kirsty is screaming her fucking ass off, and Tiffany, her face looks like she does not give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's like what happens, man. She yeah. does not give a shit that this is happening. Well, she was brought in to solve puzzles. True. She was. I don't see any she puzzles. Was. Yeah, this but is she's just like, yeah, <laughs> it's a living. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but at the top of the labyrinth, the pod returns and opens up. Out of the shadows steps Chenard, now pale-skinned and wires wrapped around his face in bloody wounds. His eyes open and he is reborn, a Cenobite. In a growl of a whisper, he says, and to think, I hesitated. So you like this? I guess yeah. <laughs> See? No, now we're back in the king yeah. corner. Yeah. <laughs> God damn it. All the way around. <laughs> I, I did laugh because it's like, are you just, is every Cenobite just given a cool leather jacket? <laughs> <laughs> like, I know. Is it like your cut? Like, the what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, and in all fairness, I say it's a cool leather jacket, but it's also fucking his nipples up. Which yeah, well, is standard. Once again, yeah. yeah. Maybe of, for him, it's... Uh, God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a long, nightmarish worm reaches out, opening its mouth to reveal a sharp, spinning apparatus. I say worm, but... Yeah, well, it looks Cinnabite. Cin- you know, yeah, yeah. And when it opened up, it looked like a butthole too. Oh come like, on, this, oh, is wow. just, <laughs> this is a lot to, to process. Right. Well, they said on the dock, and I'm sorry. <laughs> they said it was designed to look like a penis with herpes. Oh well, I mean it does. Good yeah. job. Yeah, yeah. The mission accomplished. We've all taken sex education. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We all saw that slideshow. Well, maybe that's just in Texas. I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah, I don't know. What if... Because Texas if, is really, don't have sex or else this is going to happen. You're like, that oh, was, my God. That was the whole class. Yeah, they showed us Hellraiser, too. <laughs> <laughs> but the worm sinks its jaws into the back of Chinar's head and whirs violently as he just stands there grooving on it. He, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> when that happened and it went on for a while, I was like, this is, it felt not exactly because no, but it felt kind of like Looney Tunes. <laughs> like it, <laughs> it didn't, it just seemed cartoonish and weird. Yeah. I didn't like it just really. for a second or two yeah. too long. It was, it was long. Yeah. Because I think just, well, I guess it's the pain and pleasure. So he's trying to show both. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's a difficult performance. Um, they did accomplish this shot by running it backwards. So they started with it latched onto his head yeah. and then pulling back ah, all right. and d- reversing it. Can't tell. Yeah, not at all. I did also want to point out, <laughs> this kind of made me laugh, but Jeffrey Portis, he said that he hired a guy to do Chenard's Cinnabite makeup. Yeah. 
And after they went through everything and he figured out what he was going to do, he said, okay, but I will only do this if I get an individual credit at the beginning of the end credits of the film. So he wants the film to end and it's a Chenard makeup by this dude's name. So oh, wow. Portis said no. <gasps> yeah. And he did it himself. God damn. What the hell? <laughs> He's like, I wanted to say I present. Yeah. <laughs> Hellbound. Hellraiser. Yeah. Yeah. Like, over the title? <laughs> He's like, I'm Tim Burton. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh Cranham had said that the entire thing was uncomfortable. The costume was very tight. Oh, I bet. And it was just they said I think it was like six hours of makeup. Damn. He's like, and it was hell on my nipples. Yeah. <laughs> that was real. That was they didn't yeah. do that. They didn't have the nipple technology yet. <laughs> but he said that to get into this he would have a glass of chardonnay beforehand oh i bet man. so he could kind of just yeah you know but he also he made me laugh because he's like the chardonnay wasn't that big of a deal because once you get in this thing all you have to say is like Rah! <laughs> <laughs> i was like that's a cool way to look yeah at it. He did also, they, they were talking about it. They said the first time he saw what it was going to be yeah. and sees himself all made up and mocked up and everything, his only comment was, I look like Elvis in his last week. Oh, oh my wow. God. And I was like, <laughs> God damn. But they laughed. They laughed about it. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. But reaching them in Tornado Alley or whatever's going on down here, <laughs> Julia tells Kirsty that she never could hold on to anything for very long. Kirsty lets go of the wall, knocking Julia into the path of the wind. Silhouetted by a beam of light, Julia holds on. Kirsty screams for Tiffany to reach for her, but Julia drags her way to both of them, but Tiffany notices that she's still holding the puzzle box. Tiffany reaches out for Julia, who smiles, but as soon as she latches onto her, the wind rips at Julia's back, tearing through her skin, basically unzipping her out of it. I mean... It's brand new skin. Yeah, they yeah. Just, you were really doing a lot. Like you were doing too much. <laughs> well, she's yeah. like fucking. She, yeah. <laughs> she was. She, she didn't was, give it time to set in. No, yeah. no. You can't just go to be the engineer and yeah. like no. rip through that hallway. <laughs> <laughs> but Julia screams <laughs> as clearly a puppet of her skinless body. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is sucked into the corridor. Poor Julia. You mean that wasn't though. really her? Yeah, it was not really no. her. <laughs> but she I, went through all that. For nothing. For what? It's a shame. For me, a bit anticlimactic. Yeah, she deserves bigger and better. Yeah. Yes. She's fucking Julia, dude. Yeah. yeah. But Tiffany just drops Julia's skin suit and very oddly does not retrieve the puzzle box. No. It's so we can add five more minutes to this. Yeah. <laughs> no shit. But Kirsty and Tiffany rush down the hallway together, finding their way out and into a hospital room as the labyrinth closes behind them. Sitting on the side of the bed, Kirsty apologizes to her father, bursting into sobs. Tiffany comforts her as best she can, and Kirsty tells her that they're getting out of here. Being back at the Institute reminds me that Kyle is dead and nobody really gives a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> like, will someone take a shift? Yeah. 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 That's fine. I can work Fridays. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> But they walk together down the hall, and outside, we see the bright blue sky swiftly turn murky and gray. As a music box music plays, Kirsty and Tiffany then pass a room full of patients, each of them attempting to solve their own puzzle boxes with chains sunk into their flesh. So he just has everybody on the yeah. <laughs> like, Are they just complimentary when you check into the hospital? <laughs> it's, it's just like a welcome back. And who's yeah. making these? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I own three, so yeah. <laughs> you'll have to pass these around. <laughs> but at the end of the room, they find a large window, and suddenly, through that window, bursts Chenard in his Cenobite form, still connected by his head to that worm. He says... The doctor is in. All right. We, yeah. <laughs> we live for a dramatic entrance. But come on. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany mutters, oh, shit, stealing Kirsty's bit. Yeah. yeah. I remember in the first film, there was a really climactic moment and Kirsty just goes, oh, shit. <laughs> I don't know if they're trying to make this our catchphrase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it works for me every time. Yeah. Though, so I got nothing. But a trio of snakes burst through Chenard's hand eyeballs and smaller snakes in their mouths blades rip through them as chenard says he recommends amputation all right 
<laughs> He's full He's of like, them. He's like, I'm, like I'm, I'm, I'm staying in <laughs> character. Right. I did want to say the stop motion. I think that it's really good for 1988. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You look back at it from 2022, you see the seams. Yeah. But they were done by Rory Fellows and Carl Watkins. A lot of the Leviathan configuration uh, turning into the diamond yeah. is also stop motion. Oh, all right. That's really cool. Good. I think yeah. for yeah. me, it adds to it. I oh, agree. Yeah. It's kind of an odd charm about these films. It's like we talked about on The Evil Dead. Oh, yeah. When they did that stop motion bit. Exactly. Yeah. It's fantastic. But you didn't appreciate it in basket case basket case i did not <laughs> <laughs> i think part of it is because i already hated belial <laughs> belial was a piece of shit <laughs> the movie's in the museum man. It, it, it is <laughs> it is the museum of modern <laughs> art <laughs> Just... but that doesn't stop him <laughs> from being a piece of shit <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> it's a fucking monster <laughs> both things can be true yeah, at that once. is yes. true and I don't want to like tease anything because we have no plans currently, but there are like three or four sequels. Oh, yeah. yikes. Well, I don't know. That. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk. <laughs> but the patients squirm in their beds as Chenard and his snakes begin to tear them apart. He then lets out a laugh that's like, he goes, ha, 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 ha. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, He's like an singing. operatic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't understand what's going on. He's loving it. He is. So he's having the yeah. time of his life. He's like, yeah, my or the time, are getting the, yeah. the time of his death. I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> but Kirsty and Tiffany duck into another room, but it's dark and chains hang from the ceiling. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. We know exactly what this is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Outstep the Cenobites, Pinhead acknowledging their lack of boxes or a way out. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to call it out. The Chatterer looks different. Yeah. yeah. And there's a reason for that. After some complaints from the actor about the first film's design, because mm -hmm. he couldn't see in it yeah. at all. Uh, he was given eyes so that he could actually see in this scene. Ah, all right. The difficulty is when we saw the chatterer earlier. Earlier, yeah. yeah he, he, didn't. he didn't have it. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a scene. There is a lot of different stories on this. Yeah. Some say the scene was filmed. Some say that it wasn't. So I don't know if it's a deleted scene or not. But there was a scene of him being reconfigured and the chatterer is given eyes in that pod. Huh. So all right, that would have been nice if it was filmed to keep in. I would have yeah. liked, yeah, because now it's a he looks different. Yeah, he looks very different. Is that when uh, Pinhead is wearing scrubs, or was that something? That's else? something different. Okay. Yeah, uh, that that's almost again that feels like Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> it really does. There was some. I think it was was it on the back of a VHS box? Yeah. yeah. There's a picture of. Why would you keep I that on there? <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks cool. It's a picture of Pinhead and the female Cenobite wearing scrubs. Yeah. And I think they're putting on like bloody masks. Ah, all right. The thing is, is they had an idea yeah. that as Julia and Kirstie are running through the hospital, they would bump into a doctor and a nurse and they would be like, you guys need to not <laughs> be here or whatever. <laughs> well, I guess they would say it better. Yeah. You guys <laughs> need to not, not be here. here. <laughs> and, Eloquence. Yes. Eloquence. This was the rough draft. All right? Yeah. <laughs> but they would slowly morph into Pinhead and the female Cenobite. Right. And so they had been, they were about to film it and they kind of realized it didn't make any fucking yeah, sense. Yeah, I was going to say this, that doesn't It doesn't film. work. Yeah. So that was the only thing that didn't make sense that they felt the need to cut? That was one of several. <laughs> well, but, but, <laughs> but those things that don't make sense make sense to this movie or this universe. Like, it's fine. It's that doesn't. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's... That's Freddy Krueger. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> they decided not to do that, but they got the picture of them in it <laughs> and then used it. Yeah, all so right. That's the, that's the story behind that. <laughs> but the female Cenobite tells Kirsty that it's time to play. No more teasing. Kirsty stops them, but Pinhead tells her no more deals. It's her flesh they want to experience, not her skill <laughs> at bargaining. I <laughs> fucking died. <In> all, <laughs> that is hilarious. In all fairness, every single time they meet, she's like, she I got a deal for you. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. What about listen. Frank? What the fuck? It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> But Kirsty promises no more deals, just information. 
Pinhead is game, but he warns her that if she tricks them again, her suffering will be legendary, <laughs> even in hell. The fact that he admits that she continues to trick them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, if you pull that shit one more time. <laughs> what? What? God damn. I'm sick of this Well, shit. I'd be tired of it, too. Yeah. yeah. But Kirsty then reveals a photograph of Captain Elliot Spencer. Pinhead takes it, but doesn't recognize himself. He initially says that it's nonsense, but Kirsty tells him that they haven't always been this way. They were human. She asks them to remember all of their confusion. The female Cenobite has had enough, but Pinhead stops her. Realization fills his face as he admits, I remember. It was funny because he's like, mm no, yeah. no. Well, I'll be damned. He's yeah. like, fuck, that is me. He's like, who's this asshole? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as, Cine- as the Cenobites slowly begin to piece their memories together, Chenard glides out of the shadows, still warming it up. <laughs> <laughs> he calls out for Tiffany, reaching out his hands for her. Snakes then reach out of his hands, one holding a flower in its mouth and one with Chenard's beckoning finger. Come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, just use your hands. No. <laughs> well, yeah, I was like, is that necessary? No. <laughs> Fingers aren't a bad thing, but not here, man. Where's the <laughs> show? He's just he's showing out. Guy. He's showing out. <laughs> but he says that he's her doctor and he's here to help. But they cower behind the Cenobites in chains. The Cenobites then turn their direction to Chenard, and Pinhead drops his photograph. Chenard remarks, good, a fight. <laughs> Y'all have All beef? Right, I yeah. never met these dudes. Like, what is going on? <laughs> well, maybe, you know, he's he's coming in here with this... Worm? Yeah, worm. Or <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, that's and gross. Like, yeah. <laughs> We're going to fight him he's over like, that. He's like, yo, what's up? And they're like, hey, what the fuck? Another Cenobite. Yeah. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm here now. He's like, no, what you can't be fuck? here. This you didn't is our turn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But Pinhead sends hooks that sink into Chenard's flesh, but his hand snakes fashion blades that chop right through them, releasing him. He then sends a sharp spike into the throat of the female Cenobite, killing her. She falls down dead, but in her human form. Yeah, what the fuck? She had really good eyebrows. Uh, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Uh, and who are you to come in here doing this shit? Like, these are the OGs. Yeah, you've been a Cenobite for yeah. like five minutes. And yeah. it's, it was so quick. Yeah. Like, I don't like this. Yeah. I don't like this at all. But Chenard then impales Butterball through the chest, who dies without incident as a human as well. Chenard then kills the Chatterer, who is impaled against a pillar... And when he spins around, it's revealed that the human form of the Chatterer, played by Kevin Cole, is a child. Oh, wow. What the? I was like, he's a little boy? Yeah. yeah. He should not have been a party to any of no. this. Yeah. They should have been like, what was it? Uh, it wasn't the box. It was Desire. Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. Bye. Yeah. He's a little boy. What yeah. The, and he's the scariest one. Yeah. <laughs> he is. But Chenard tells Pinhead that he's taking over this operation. Because he's a surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> no, he doesn't stop with the yeah. doctor no, stuff. He keeps him coming. He's just, you just got here. Oh, like, yeah. Like, this is really fucking bold. It's disrespectful. Yeah. It is. Well, maybe he did so much crazy shit when he was on Earth that when he was given his Cenobite power, it's it just, was like, ah, here, just, you can have it all. <laughs> just whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The Le- Leviathan's like, honestly, I'm impressed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, with his whole, I'm taking over this operation line. He says that Kirsty and Tiffany will be his first patients. Mm-mm. Don't like that. No. no. But bright blue lightning bursts from the wounds in Chenard's palms, encircling Pinhead's head and slowly turning him human. <laughs> I was like, he hit him with the human ray? I, yeah. I don't know. Pinhead into regular head. Now he's <laughs> fucking he's like, human head. Yeah. <laughs> That's not as catchy. Yeah, no. I did laugh though because they. <laughs> They show him as Captain Spencer. Yeah. And then they show the photo on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's Remember, you. guys? Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> We've been through this. Yeah. But Captain Spencer, now fully human, turns to Kirsty and Tiffany, giving a silent nod for them to make their exit. It's a real, that'll do, pig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now you're on their side. So- I, I don't I, know. It's all very confusing. Yeah. We're playing both sides. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> so you always come out on top. But he's like, if I can't 
to have y'all then get the fuck out of here. I don't want this ass to get. No, he yeah. doesn't deserve it. No. no. But Chenard then slices his throat and he dies dramatically. Chenard then wails wildly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's the, that opera show. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he <laughs> is gasping for air with the wound in his throat uh-huh. and it looks really good. Yeah. yeah. It It's like the way it's moving. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, 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 we kind of hinted at this a second ago, but I really don't like this part at all. No, it's really, again, like with Julia, it's anticlimactic for these baddies that have been built since yeah. the first one. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, did they have plans for a sequel or was this going to be kind of it? Honestly, the one, two punch of it is fine Yeah, with me if that's what they're doing, but it just sucks to see these characters just eat it like this. Yeah. Yeah. They, they put up one fight. Uh, yeah. yeah very little <laughs> they're like we'll try one hook and if that doesn't yeah. work we'll just let him kill right. us fuck yeah <laughs> it was a really weird battle tactic yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they really did just stand there <laughs> yeah like, I'll give one after the other just something I, yeah I nobody <laughs> no and on that documentary Barbie Wilde had a very interesting idea she had said the thing that will allow her to accept this happening is if we understand that what happened is Kirsty's fault, that her reminding them of their humanity made them weak. Ah, uh, all right. Which is okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, but at I the same guess. time, you're, you still have to contend with the fact that this baby Cenobite fucked yeah. up these immortal sex demons. But the only one that was really faced with his mortality was pinhead yeah the we were rest kind of, of them like, were like no 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 <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, let's, I don't, let's kill yeah, him <laughs> he had to tell him to wait yeah, yeah i don't know and they turned into humans after yeah but they never saw that no they didn't look at their hand they're like oh my god <laughs> and now i'm dead he was right yeah and now i'm a corpse but yeah so i don't like this at all plus i don't really like chenard's cinnabite yeah i like the look of him i don't like the worm <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> they, they lose me at the worm. yeah <laughs> But back in the hall in the Institute, Tiffany says that she has to solve the puzzle. The Cenobites remembered who they were and they got better. She says that... That's not what happened. No. Yeah. (laughs) They were... I don't know about better. (laughs) They were murdered. Promptly killed. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But they travel through the patient ward, finding that they've all been massacred by Chenard. They make it back to the hospital room and an entrance to the labyrinth opens up for them. They rush inside to retrieve the puzzle box from the grasp of Julia's skin suit. I did laugh a little bit because, like, the way that everything's just opening up for them. Yeah. It may be, you remember the end of As Above, So Below, where it's just like, all right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Out you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're just going to do a speed run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but once they have the box, they continue on, Tiffany leading the way to the top of the labyrinth. The Leviathan beams long shadows towering over them, but they continue on. As the light hits Tiffany, much like Chenard, she has a vision. She remembers Chenard standing over her during surgery, and then she sees her mother asking Chenard for help, saying that puzzles are consuming Tiffany's life. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she just like likes yeah, puzzles, dude. <laughs> it doesn't have to be like, like that. She's eating them. I don't. <laughs> she's, uh, okay, we all I don't have hobbies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She figured out one puzzle. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's like, she's got a fucking problem. It's like, we're just trying to sit <laughs> yeah. here. Oh my God. S- stare at the wall. <laughs> and fucking <laughs> Tiffany keeps ruining it for everyone. <laughs> but we see Chenard throw his hand over Tiffany's mother's mouth, intercut with shots of him anesthetizing Tiffany. So he killed so, her mom. <laughs> so he yeah. murdered her mother because she's good at puzzles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that article, he's like, I read one article about a psychic link. <laughs> That's enough to commit a murder, I think. Who knows? What if Tiffany's mother is one of the bodies that are hanging in the thing? What it was, Could be. Was that her mom that he was cutting into her head earlier in that in that room and then he left her oh. there? You know, I don't know. I don't well, know. that's really fucked up if everyone's sitting around <laughs> watching that. <laughs> Kyle's like, no, yeah, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's bad. <laughs> so he did know about it. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe he was Let's part of it. Let's just say yeah. that's not her. Okay. <laughs> But Tiffany cries out, but Kirsty tells her that she sees now the Leviathan is a puzzle. This gives Tiffany the courage to march forward. She makes her way to the Leviathan as music swells eerily. She begins to solve the box in her hands, but before she can, Chenard returns, whipping Kirsty against a wall. He sarcastically asks, 
how Tiffany is feeling today. <laughs> <laughs> He's just on the doctor yeah. show. He can't stop. I love it. Honestly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> His snakes grow spiky as he tells the girls that they have their whole lives behind them now. Very good. Yeah. And it's a shame that he has no anesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> Did I write that? I think so. <laughs> you were a consultant. <laughs> he glides worm style over their path, telling Tiffany that surgery is open and reminding her that today's agenda is evisceration. <laughs> <laughs> I will say we're getting this lino rama with this fucking doctor, yeah. but surgery is open. Is not yeah. done. <laughs> <laughs> they just ran out of. <laughs> That's that was not... a placeholder line. Yeah. Yeah. They, they fell through the cracks. <laughs> Clearly, but his snakes turn into whirring blades, and as Tiffany attempts to back away from them, she almost steps into the cinnabite pod. But someone stands in the way to stop her, and it appears to be Julia. Who has hastily put her skin back on. Clearly. Yes. <laughs> she gave it the Larry Frank treatment. Yeah. <laughs> but Chenard says that he knew she'd come back and leans in to kiss her. This gives Tiffany the opening to retrieve the puzzle box and solve it while they make out. Yeah. yeah like, Y'all are busy. I got a little yeah. bit of time. But the, the puzzle box is like, all right. <laughs> Again, like you said. Sure. Just, yeah, just yeah. let it happen. It's the end. It's fine. <laughs> we got like five minutes left, yeah. guys. <laughs> But she slowly twists it back into the shape of the lament configuration. And once she does, Chenard goes to attack her, telling her that her case is closed and he's afraid it's terminal. <laughs> <laughs> but his snakes slice her hand, but they get stuck in the ground as they go in for a second taste. Just then, his headworm rips the top of his head off at the jaw. Yeah. Leaving him a bloody mess. I don't... Why did it betray him? It's okay, Doc. Nothing to lose your head over. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to use huh? that one every yeah. <laughs> The doctor is out. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Right. He's being sued for malpractice. Yeah. <laughs> right. That hospital lost a lot uh, yeah, of money. This, yeah. It's really not funny at all. It's going to close down. Tiffany then fall. The hospital's named after him. I just remember yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but Tiffany then falls off the ledge, but catches herself. Kirstie's voice comes through Julia's lips, and she tells Tiffany to trust her. She tries to pull her up, but the arm of the Julia skin suit falls off, falling off the ledge, and is obliterated at the bottom. The Julia skin suit fully tearing now. Tiffany is pulled to safety. Kirstie. <laughs> This is a big reveal. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Kirsty pulls the Julia mask away, revealing that she's Kirsty. Holy wow. fuck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are we're using face off logic again. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where I don't think <laughs> that it's taken into account that the bones underneath the skin matter. <laughs> like it's oh, not shit. it's not just the skin <laughs> that makes us Look no, like what is. we look like you will look different yeah, yeah. <laughs> i did her laugh. eyes were blue oh shit <laughs> <laughs> they, we weren't supposed to pay attention <laughs> no. just, all right i did laugh very hard because it's really funny to think that chenard throws her against the wall and she's like i got an idea <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she runs she back. Ran back she put the earrings on <laughs> she did oh yeah <laughs> well those could have been on the suit still i don't know <laughs> <laughs> they're still on her oh then i don't know <laughs> But Tiffany and Kirsty hug, and before they can make their exit, Leviathan sends out a burst of blue lightning, slowly morphing into the shape of the Lament configuration and sending blasts at the girls. They run as fast as they can down the corridor, avoiding the beams and making it back to the hospital room unscathed. As I saw this, I was like, they just cannot end a Hellraiser film without some bad. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Won't do it. But now, fully in cube form, the Leviathan closes the entrance to the labyrinth with an odd wailing noise. Now, back home safe, Kirsty and Tiffany smile at each other and exit the hospital. We see wreaths of flowers placed on the empty beds of the mutilated patients, which I guess is kind of nice. Yeah. And they all lived happily ever after. I hope. <laughs> I was like, can we put the lament configuration behind glass in the Warren's goodie room and just be done with <laughs> it. Like, stop fucking with it, please. We might get another spinoff if we do, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, and I, this made no sense to me. But later on, Kirsty and Tiffany walk away from the hospital together, and I'm not sure how much later, because they're wearing brand new clothes. Yes. And their hair is styled differently. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, the lawsuit took some time, <laughs> so they're like, they own yeah. the institution. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, they should have shown the sign. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're rich as fuck. <laughs> but in Chenard's empty house, a couple of moving men, played by Ron Travis and Oliver Parker, move boxes out of the house. This is very interesting because whenever he was, you remember when Larry cut his hand, yeah. There were two mo- movers that were helping him move the bed. One of them was another actor, but one of them was Oliver Parker. Ah, oh, shit. All right. So this is the same company, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do good work. They, well, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but worker one asks who any of the stuff belongs to, but worker two says that it isn't their problem. Worker two then heads to the study, finding Julia's stained mattress on the floor. It's concerning that it's still wet. Yeah. And he touches it for some reason, yeah. too, which I don't quite understand. Slime, like, covers his finger, mm-hmm. and he calls out to worker one to take a look, but as he does, bloody limbs reach out from the bed, pulling him closer. And I... <laughs> <laughs> worker one returns to the room to find the body of his co-worker half inside the mattress. Just then, a pillar of faces and torture instruments rise from the ground, twisting as horrific music plays. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> We see Pinhead's face, along with skinless Julia, tiny skeletons, that sewn shut mouth baby, and it ends on the torn face of a bearded man, possibly the dragon bone demon. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But even in like this pillar form, I'm like, y'all are still horny? Oh, they were. Yeah. I'm I'm like, oh my God. Dude, pain and pleasure. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. They seem to have a... That's great. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But the face of that dragon man, he's, he's just a man. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> he asks, what's your pleasure, sir? The film ends and the credits roll. Before we get into everything else, I do want to say that in the original ending that they were going to have, mm-hmm. it was supposed to be that the blood from the workers go into the mattress and Julia is reborn. Ah, all right. I would have loved that. They had it all filmed, and she was wearing that dress that Chenard gave her. Yeah. Okay, but it was all black. That all would right. be because the last time we see her when she's not being impersonated by Kirsty, uh huh, she's just whipped into that tornado. Yeah, thing, and oh, we that's never it. See yeah, her again. yeah, that's and I don't think that's a fitting in for her. No. no. Plus. And maybe it's because they knew that she wasn't going to want to sign on to do more. Yeah. So they changed it. I know that Pinhead took over and everybody's little well, Pinhead's very marketable as yeah, well. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes sense. But yeah. to me, if we're going by the story. I agree. <sighs> yeah. And that was Clive Barker's idea. He said, like, uh, what do we say about George Lucas? He's like, Julie is the key to all of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I would have preferred that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to ask, what did you guys think of Hellbound Hellraiser 2? I did enjoy this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, there are problems. <laughs> like it it's it's uh some problems. Yeah. <laughs> but um I mean it I do enjoy seeing the Cenobites more, mm-hmm. hearing them kind of interact with uh is it Kirsty or Christy or Kirsty? Kirsty. Yeah. yeah, there you go. In between. Uh, <laughs> I do enjoy them interacting with her more and kind of, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Us getting to get a sense of who they are a little more. Um, it just, uh, I don't understand some of the choices they made. Is this happening all day after day from when we just seen the last movie? Why it is, seems to be right? Yeah. Why and why is she here instead of not at the police station? I mean, getting help or trying to figure out what's going on. You, uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, your boyfriend's where now? Yeah, yeah, dude. For all you know, Steve killed everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you mean he went like, home? She did it and ran away. Or is he there somewhere else? We don't know. No idea. You don't tell or us. Or did Chenard kill him? Oh, yeah. yeah. That we don't been cool know. To know. Any yeah. Of but uh, uh, the visuals, the the effects, like it's really cool. Yeah. I do enjoy the one liners. Uh, that that was fantastic. I did, but like I said, there are things I remembered. Um, uh, the doctor transforming. Okay, I do remember that. I remember the pinhead fight when he's fighting them. I remember that. I think fight uh, is is well, loose. loose. Yeah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> But uh, like I said, there were a lot of it, too, that I didn't remember. Mm-hmm. But I did enjoy this movie. Uh, where I'm sitting right now, I I 
not going to say it was bad, bad. Like, it, like, are like worse than the first one. Usually, oh, no. sequels yeah. suck. No, like, I'm still on board. Like, I, yeah, I'm still with it. Yeah, I would say I enjoyed this probably just as much as oh, I yeah. enjoyed the first one. Um, there are moments that didn't super work for me, but I feel like that was the same thing in the first one. Yeah. It's not perfect, but I think a lot of the... <laughs> A lot of the shortcomings narratively you can kind of overlook because the effects are so good. Right. That's and fair. I mean, there is there's a lot to love about this. And I can see maybe even more so now after watching two of them, mm -hmm. why people love this franchise so much. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because it has created like this whole universe. Yeah. Of just fucking insanity. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, you got to respect that even if you don't appreciate the films or you don't like them you have yeah. to respect that a lot of thought was put into this oh, universe yeah. mm -hmm. you know um, and this allowed them to expand it even more yeah, oh, yeah exactly so i really liked this i'm i'm kind of surprised at how much i liked it mm -hmm. and i had a lot of fun talking about it as <laughs> well yes um i think that this film kind of does exactly what a sequel should do yeah, yeah. it brings things from the first film kind of recontextualizes them and expands on what was there before. Mm -hmm. And it summarizes the entire first one. <laughs> <laughs> if that's your thing, man. A couple times. Yeah. <laughs> A couple times. I, I just think that it was very well put together. There are those things that do kind of stand out. Yeah. Um, fucking Chenard's worm thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And his quick dispatching of the Cenobites. Yeah. yeah. Those two are like really like glaring negatives for me. Yeah. yeah. But I think that there is so much good in this. I would I would put it up with the first one. For oh, sure. Yeah. And if you watch them back to back, you'll see a lot of scenes twice. But <laughs> <laughs> it honestly would work very well. Yeah, it would. But I guess we can go into ratings. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that the positives for me... Claire Higgins. Yes. Yeah. I think that she is so brilliant and she plays this character. I think the thing for me is that there can be a point where you're so evil that you dip into too campy. Yeah. Like She's, cartoonish. Yes. She stays perfectly oh, where yeah. she needs to be. And I think that it should be the two of them is Hellraiser. Yeah. yeah. That's to me. And of course, also Pinhead in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they can stay. Yeah, they can stay. Well, Pinhead in them. <laughs> his whole group, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that they should come back. I know that they do in every one of them. I'm interested to know how they come back. Yeah. Because, but then again, you, he literally. He Frank, was in the pillar. Frank literally said you can't kill what's dead. You know, it's already dead. Yeah, well, yeah. I don't, I don't well Frank's what he said. dead now. Yeah. Well, he was uh, also a pervert. We shouldn't listen yeah. to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he shouldn't be the arbiter of what this franchise is <laughs> but <laughs> also on the positive side for me is the score uh, christopher young kills it yeah yeah uh, the production design makeup effects i will never get over how cool those skinless corpses look yeah fantastic they're just the greatest um on the negative side i already said chenard god damn if i had a hard time saying chenard this whole time yeah i don't yeah. like the name i miss malahide that might have been better <laughs> <laughs> but um i think that chenard as a character is fine his performance is great. Yeah. No issues there. It's just what is done at the end. Right. The whole thing with that, I just don't know how well it works for me. Yeah. All right. I don't mind him being the evil Cenobite. Right. No. Getting exactly what he asked for. Just really rushed or... Kind of. Yeah. It does... I mean, I don't know. And it does feel like a lot of characters that deserve more time just get murked. Yeah. yeah. Julia's Too gone. Uh, Anticlimactic. Yeah. Cenobites. It's just kind of... Yeah. But I also... <laughs> Want to point out that Kyle meant nothing to the story. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. And I, I would have preferred my rewrite of it. All right. Yeah. Where maybe he was tricked too. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know. That would have been better for sure. Yeah. But for me, out of 10 painfully pleasurable puzzle boxes, I am going to give Hellbound Hellraiser 2 seven painfully pleasurable puzzle boxes out of 10. And I feel good about that. Yeah. Yeah. But I will now open up the floor to you. I um no, I agree with you. And and I don't I don't mind so much some of the like like you said, the negatives aren't so big to where it overshadows it. Mm -hmm. But I do still kind of feel like it 
it does still kind of hurt it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, yeah. It is very, we don't have a time frame. We don't know what's going on. Like I said earlier, her boyfriend's just gone. <laughs> we don't know anything about that. No. Same thing like you said with Kyle. If if he had a little more, if he was drawn out just a tiny bit more, then maybe we would have gave a shit. Yeah. But yeah, we, nobody yeah, cared. We really, yeah, we <laughs> really cared. didn't. Nobody, yeah. I was like, what? Uh, we know the doctor was doing bad shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like, what, like what, what more? You know what I mean? I know we seen some jars and whatever. Then he kind of drilled into that lady's head for a second. And then it, that was it. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, you're gone. I was like, what the fuck? He's trying yeah. to bring Julia back. Then he's getting off on the mummy. And it's like, what? On the mummy. Yeah. It's like, what the fuck is it? <laughs> it, But I did, uh, I, I did enjoy this. Yeah. I will agree though, strongly with the fight air quote, fight whatever it's just it was it was very underwhelming and if you're gonna do that at least let everyone get some kind of yeah like punch or attack in or something you know like final fantasy okay it's your turn (laughs) now go yeah Yeah. Yeah. you go (laughs) but no i want to see what they do strategize yeah Yeah. let's let's see how they attack let's see and then even like you said it i feel like it would have been cool if if the way the Cenobites are, you have to call them or you got to do something bad or whatever to get their attention. Mm-hmm. If she's trying to take over, not only would that still make it where they could not be good, but they're still fighting for their yeah. turf. But because she's one of them now, she does have powers as well. And she is trying to fight them or get away from them every time to find a uh, Kirsty and like you can't you know what I mean and yeah. they're like no 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 she's mine so now they're fighting that's and cool it's like, yeah that's fine yeah I'll watch a trilogy yeah, yeah. but yeah it, it the end did feel kind of quick and it was like man and I I the and you're right the the doctor thing they said I've only seen this movie like I said at least once or twice and I remembered that shit yeah, yeah. I was like holy fuck he looked really cool the he penis did. thing no. eh, yeah, a, little, <laughs> a little weird but I mean <laughs> hey if that's what they were trying to pull off they did it. they landed it yeah. Yeah, yeah they did it um but for me on a scale from one to ten painfully pleasurable puzzle boxes I'm gonna give help Hellbound. <laughs> there you go. Hellraiser 2. There you go. Not Hellbound 2, Hellraiser. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh 7.5. Okay. Uh I I only took off that half point because of the like, you know what I mean? Cuz it does and that was one of my notes too. This is the Halloween 2 treatment. Yeah. You know what I mean? And same thing. I liked Halloween 2 except for the sibling bullshit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? I liked this except for at the end he fucked off the Cinnabites <laughs> quick. Too quick. And then yeah. it was like, peace. And then just kept coming with the one line. It's just like, damn, dude. The, what leave, some some cool the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, leave some cool for the rest of us. Yeah. Leave some cool for the fuck. Come on, dude. What are you doing? <laughs> how, when I become a Cinnabite, how the fuck am I supposed to top All that? the I lines are fine. Yeah, yeah, come yeah. on. You got the snake fingers and all that weird shit. Too much. Okay, yeah, come on. Dude, just die in the back of it. When you think <laughs> about it, Ben Ed just has the pins like nobody yeah, else. That's it. His only attack was the hook. <laughs> yeah. and that was that's it. it. They do it too much. Yeah. They all gave up. The, oh shit if he can't hook him we're fucked Fuck, yeah well, how do we know that hey, wait, do he's, something he's got a blue human <laughs> ring yeah, <dude. laughs> oh that's up. it what the that's fuck it. Yeah, that's it i didn't even know that was part of the customization <laughs> suite <laughs> <laughs> no i totally agree with you guys um that was my my major drawbacks was i feel like julia was so much more mm-hmm. than kind of what she ended up as yeah because, I mean, this really full circle moment of her kind of saying fuck you to Frank, killing him after he killed her. And then it's like, oh, she's just whisked away by the wind. Yeah, and that's yeah. it. That is very upsetting. Mm-hmm. I love her. I loved her in the first one. She's such a fucking good villain. It is heartbreaking that this was it. Uh-huh. And like we've said, we've said it to death at this point. But the final showdown with Chenard and the Cenobites was... <laughs> underwhelming to say the least yeah. mm-hmm. um i feel like we introduced some really interesting themes about humanity but even that is not fully flushed out no pun intended <laughs> but there's so much good here it is almost as good as the first one and yeah. that really does not happen no um so on a scale from one to ten painfully pleasurable puzzle boxes there you go i gave the original hellraiser an eight i'm also gonna give Hellbound, 
Hellraiser 2, mm-hmm. a 7.5. Nice. It is, it's almost there. It is. Yeah. There's just I, a little bit more. Uh, even if you have to kill Julia or get rid of her, make it a bi- something bigger. She, yeah. She's the queen of hell, dude. Yeah, you give her that title. That's yeah. it. That's a big yeah. deal. That's all? I mean, I, I don't know. I will say I am looking forward to seeing what they do with the series. Me yeah. too. I'm After a little this. scared. Oh, yeah. I'm a little scared too. <laughs> I will admit that. Um, I will say though, in defense of Chenard, when I order some Cinnabites, I also move through those pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all from us at Pod Mortem. What would you rate Hellbound Hellraiser 2 and what should we watch next? Let us know on Twitter at the Pod Mortem. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook. Be sure to follow each of us on Twitter at TravisMWH, at Blood and Smoke, and at RealStreeter84. Please consider pledging to our Patreon and stay tuned until after the music for a special thank you to our Wendigo Gitter patrons. And remember, curiosity may open up worlds to you, but you never know what's waiting on the other side. Until next time. Thank you for staying tuned. We want to give a very special thank you to all of our Wendigo Gitter patrons. Woo! Woo! Yeah! yeah. Special thank you <laughs> to... <laughs> Chris Ontiveros, Kristen Lofton, Megan Martinez, Kimberly Bass, Sophie Hodson, Anthony Jerome M., Jordan Nash, Kent Morton, Guy54, Lala Thomas, Travis Anissa Hunter, Miguel Myers ATX, Jennifer Perez, Pierre Lombard, Allison O'Neill, Carissa, TJ and Angie Bronson, Gabrielle Trevino, Spooky Mom, Andy Teague, Applin Ontiveras, Karima Rhodes, Antonio Huerta, Kimberly Kleindienst, Will Brown, Sidney Smith, Osvaldo Soto, Jonathan Booth, Bobby Holmes, Donna Eason, JD Rizak, Molly Gerhardt, Armand Spasto, Aaron Aguirre, Eggy, William Barry, Brittany Ramatar, Charity Oxner, Amanda Six, Mandy Rainwater, Eden, Jordan Roberts, Dylan, Melissa Sierra, Holly Bryan, Jordan Blevins, Liz Heath, Spencer Montalvo, Pancake the Panda, John Ramos, Michael Newding, Alexis Roberts, Dan Laveau, Itzy M, Gary Horton, Amanda Aliff, Leisha Olivier, Kate Lamp, Carlos and Sydney, Jessica Hunter, Helena Rudder, Alan Johnston, Mariah, Livy Fun, Mandy M, Scott Troutman, Mozzie Bear, Brittany G, Dave Burke, Adrian Stakes, Craig Kowalski, Beth, Nick Spill, Emma Hagel Kissinger, Ashley Weidman, Angelica Cornelius Witt, Valerie G, JSL, Emiliana, Brian Glass, CB, Maya Noches, Taylor Santana, Will Lewison, Angelique, Smelly Poo Poo Head, Beth Bauer, Ben Coons, Cookie, Esperanza J, Jace OKC, Joshua Rumley, Danielle Peralta, Hannah R, Brandon, Nicholas Carter, Sawyer Reese Farr, Dr. Diva Loves Horror, Girl That's Scary, M. Fryback, Cassandra, Andrea Simmons, Ashley Higuera, and William Rush. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. yes. We love each and every one of you. Oh, yeah. I have to say that nobody's better Leviathan you. Hey. <laughs> very good. <laughs> I, I stretched yeah, that out. <laughs> <laughs> Made it work. I tried. Until next time.